Good evening. I'm calling to order the meeting of the Arlington School Committee on Thursday, October 14th, 2021. I am Bill Hainer, the chair. But may me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. When I call your name, please respond in the affirm affirmative. Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Good evening. Dr. Ampey. Yes. Uh, Ms. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Holman. Yes. Dr. McNeil. Yes. Mr. Spiegel. Yes. Ms. Elmer. Yes. And I'm not sure if the student uh, representatives here, let's see, Megan Carmody, are you present? I am not seeing either of them. Um, okay. Okay, in. I'll I'll hold off. And uh, tonight's they meeting of the hour. Oh, here's one. <laughs> here they are. They did receive the links. Yep. Okay, sorry. Megan Carmody, just say yes, you're here. Yeah. Thank you, Megan. And uh, Amy Shalario, is she here? I don't see Amy yet. Okay, we'll we'll get her in eventually. Thank you. Tonight's meeting of the Arlington, uh, Arlington School Committee is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act signed into law on June 16th, 2021, that extends certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency. The act includes an extension until April 1st, 2022 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 executive order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. The governor's order, which is referenced with agenda materials on the town's website for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Before we begin, permit me to offer a few notes. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom and is being recorded and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that they will be visible to others and that if they wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name and in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. All participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the Novus Agenda platform. And finally, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call. I'm now gonna read a statement and I will read this at the beginning of every meeting concerning a public uh, comment. For members of the public who wish to address the committee, there will be 30 minutes of public comment set aside. Depending on the number of people who sign up, time allotments may be reduced, but will not exceed three minutes each. If the number of people who sign up exceeds what can be done in 30 minutes, the number of speakers will be capped and will be invited to speak based on timestamp of their email to Ms. Diggins. The school committee is respectfully request participants of the public to utilize their camera if possible while speaking and to adhere to the public comment policy BEDH that requires participants to provide their name and address. Speakers may offer such object objective criticisms of the school operations and programs as concern them. But in public session, the committee will not hear personal complaints about school personnel nor against any member of the school community, except for the school committee or the superintendent in their capacity as the operational leader of the Arlington Public Schools. Additionally, the committee will not hear anything that might identify or infringe upon a student's privacy by name or incident. If you would like to sign up to speak, please email Ms. Diggins at ediggins at arlington.k12.ma.us by 12 noon on the date of the meeting. First item on the agenda is AHS student representatives to the school committee. Um, Dr. Holman. Hi everybody. Um, I see that our student representative Megan Carmody is here and at this point I'll invite her to talk. I know that our student representatives were also considering or potentially needing to swap off when they would attend our meetings because they're very busy people with a lot of extracurricular activities. Um, so Ms. Carmody, um, I would love to invite you to update the school committee on any student things that are going on at AHS that you think that they should know about as well as say hello to everybody. Welcome to the team. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Megan Carmody. I'm a junior at HS. Um, there is another student representative, but she could not attend this meeting. Her name's Amy, so you'll probably meet her in the future. Um, yeah, so what's going on at HS is that the Drama Guild is having their first play of the year, and they'll be performing Metamorphosis by Mary Zimmerman at noon and 4 p.m. Saturday and Sunday. So if you'd like to go and see that, you can look at the AHS website for more information. Um, as well, at the end of the month, we'll be hosting a club day for students to find new clubs and get more involved in the school. And then on a student council update, the student council is currently holding their freshman student officer elections. Great. Uh, Megan, I just want you to be aware that uh, as each item comes up, I will invite the members of the committee uh, to make any comment and I will, uh, if you want to make comment, just raise your hand and uh, you give us the student view of this. So thank you very much for attending. I really appreciate this. Hiring update, Mr. Spiegel. Um, sorry, Mr. Oh, Hager, sorry. Uh, one other guest who's here at the very top of our agenda. I apologize. I so do not minutes. have, I didn't update my agenda. Go right ahead. Okay, um, I just want to take a minute because uh, we had we had put this up at the top of the agenda and I want to make sure Sarah Marie doesn't feel like she needs to stay though she's more than welcome to because we are celebrating Thompson in all sorts of ways tonight. Um, Sarah Marie Jetty is a teacher at the Thompson School she's teaching third grade this year and she has previously taught is it fourth and fifth grade Sarah Marie. Um, at the Thompson School, and she was recently recognized. She's actually recognized in the spring as a finalist, semi-finalist for Teacher of the Year. Um, and they recently published an article in the Globe about this. And I wanted to take a minute to applaud Sarah Marie and celebrate our spectacular teachers as we celebrate Thompson today and invite her to say hello to the committee really quickly and for all of you to give her our congratulations as well. Well, I, I spoke about 15 months ago to the committee. You might remember it. I was pleading to teach remotely. I live in a multi-generational household with my Mexican-American mom and COVID has disproportionately affected people of color. And I was terrified. Um, when Karen told me that I could teach remotely, I promised that I would do whatever I could to make it the best year ever. And Karen said, I know you will. And doing something brand new and so hard, having that confidence really pushed me through. Um, I learned so much, I grew so much. It reminded me a lot of the Peace Corps where you have a plan and then something happens and then it's totally different, but you roll with it. Um, and a big thing I learned was uh, the questions my students asked more than ever. I needed their questions to know if I was being clear across the screen. I needed to know if my directions were, were good enough. I was moving too fast, but we developed this community where any question mattered, every question mattered. And by having that understanding, I could pause and know that I needed to take care of whatever they were asking because for these kids, a tenth to, to a quarter of their lives has been lived in a global pandemic and they don't remember things that happened two years ago. Like my daughter doesn't remember going to the Museum of Science since she's nine and we used to be members. So they're going through so much and last year was about community and making sure they felt safe and loved. And it was so hard, but I will treasure it always. I miss, their, I miss the little toddlers who'd come in and the, the pet turtle that passed away sadly. And there was a bearded dragon. We just had, it was such a community. And I felt very privileged to have had the opportunity to work remotely. I'm never going to be grateful for COVID, but I'm very grateful to have had that opportunity to push my my profession and myself. And that was one of the reasons why when third grade opened up, I thought I'm gonna, I took that challenge last year and I'll, I'll do something new this year. So but thank you for having me. Sarah, thank you. And I only been very fortunate to have teachers like you uh, with our children. Thank you so much. Now, Mr. Spiegel, hiring updates. Right, oh, thank you. Sorry, wait a minute, sure. Superintendent Watt. Oh. Dr. You Holman, you, you have a hand up, Mr. Hainer. Pardon me? You have a hand up. I'm sorry. Jenna, I apologize. Go right ahead. That's okay. The AEA just wanted to congratulate Sarah Marie as well. She's not only a phenomenal teacher, she's one of our phenomenal building reps um, you know, supporting her colleagues at Thompson. So congratulations from the AEA. Well deserved. Thank you. Thank you. 
I am going to leave. My husband and I are having a night out away from the kids, like the second in like a long time. I can't even remember before. So have Enjoy. a nice night. Thank you for, thank you for having me. Now I'm going to pause. I'm going to look. I'm going to check. One more time, Mr. Spiegel. If you if you don't make it this time, you're off the hook. You can go away. Go for it. Okay. Well, thank you. That's that's hard to follow. Um, so I'm I'm going to be giving the staffing update, and um, you know we're yeah, we've recruited educators and and staff to uh, to serve our children as well as Sarah Marie, and uh, it's a tough it's tough to follow, but we our attempt is to always hire excellent educators. So I'm going to, I think I can share my screen. Okay. Can you see that? Oops. Yes. I'm going to play from the beginning. Sorry. Okay. So here's the staffing update. Um, so as you know, we have several new administrators in the district, including the superintendent, director of DEI this year, if the, the, a new position for the district. A METCO director who is, you know, because Margaret became the director of DEI, we needed a new METCO director. Director of Digital Learning, Director of Nursing, a Special Education Coordinator at the middle school and at the elementary school. A lot of new assistant principals in the district. So all of our, uh, thanks to this, the school committee, all of our assistant principals at the elementary schools are full-time. So the, the, a few changes. One, we already had full-time, continuing full-time at Stratton. Three, half-time moved to full-time at Bishop, Dallin, and Hardy. Um, two new assistant principals to the district who moved from um, teacher and social worker positions, um, one at Brackett, one at Thompson, and um, Ms. Chevalier is here for the Thompson assistant principal, and a new assistant principal who is new to the district at Pierce. Um, we have a new assistant principal at Gibbs who moved from the middle school special, special ed coordinator position. For the new unit A, A, A unit A educators, as of, this presentation, we had 66 new hires uh, beginning on or after September 1st. Um, we also had 13 um, educators who started last year after the beginning of the school year, who said were not in my report from last year, but we, because of COVID and, and um, some other reasons where we needed to do some shifting, we had to hire educators last year. 13 of them are continuing. Um, we have, um, you know, replace some educators who retired, some who resigned, some who moved to a different position, uh, including uh, the people who became assistant principals and others. Um, two, uh, we have some educators on full year leaves of absence um, and some additional positions new to the budget or because of the needs of the system. And then some of the, um, the ads uh, from last year that we added, um, again, are continuing um, when they moved into new open, open positions. They, they were in um, positions last year that didn't necessarily continue, but they were able to move into to open positions this year. Um, I, I'd like to, I've been doing exit interviews a couple different ways. I give people a choice whether they wanna do a, a, an online exit interview, just a, filling out a Google form with some questions or one-on-one -on -one conversations with me. Um, you know, there are people who move away from the area. There, sometimes the commuting time is a challenge for people. There are people who have had made professional career moves within education, including becoming administrators in other districts. Um, and again, some people do leave for compensation reasons. Um, we have had people leave because they're going back to graduate school. And then there are other personal reasons. Um, the hires by the school um, since last year, uh, or yeah, I think, I think um, actually, I think that's actually since um, the beginning of this year, um, the hires uh, for the schools at the beginning of this current school year. Um, a lot of our hires have master's degrees. We have a very well-educated um, staff in the district that our unit A educators are, are, have, are highly educated. As we have done every year in this district, we have promoted people who have been teaching assistants or long-term substitutes or student teachers. We also have two of our new hires this year, our former teachers in the district who returned. They, le they left for um, other, either other jobs or to take some time off and are now back in the district as a teacher. 
Um, the paraprofessionals, the paraprofessionals is a broad unit of teaching assistants, behavioral support paraprofessionals, building subs, tutors, um, and there's a lot of new ones um, since last October. Uh, we're still looking for some paraprofessionals and teaching assistants, some in special education uh, primarily, and, uh, and that's, that's still going on. Uh, we have quite a few new administrative assistants in the district, including your school committee and superintendent, uh, Ms. Diggins. Um, we have new building administrative assistants at Pierce, Bishop, and Gibbs. Uh, we have a new, uh, an ad that uh, uh, started last year in the HR payroll office, um, who sits in, in our HR uh, suite. Um, we added a position of curriculum directors, administrative assistants, who's working with our curriculum directors to support them, and a person in the business office who replaced um, someone who moved to a, a, a different position. And other new employees include after school program, food service custodians, traffic, desktop support technicians, and daycare substitutes, summer. We had a lot of summer program teachers community ed, athletic coaches. Um, so we've still been doing all of the new hire meetings through uh, virtually through Zoom. Um, new hire forms are sent through DocuSign. And again, we're doing all the things we need to do, including Corey fingerprinting and now proof of COVID vaccination. And um, again, this is a lot of work for the HR office, for our IT department to both give people accounts and devices, uh, central office staff um, in all of the central office offices, including especially payroll, which does a lot to get people on board and paid. Um, and um, we had a successful new hire orientation this year. We were able to do it mostly in person with some virtual sessions. And, um, you know, we have a well-developed and well-run mentoring and induction program that will continue. So that's the new hire report and I can stop the share there. Um, I think and then I can go to the diversity hiring report as well. Um, so let me go to that share. And okay. Okay. So um, again, we've been we like to compare the student data. Um, to our staffing data. Um, this student data is not complete. We, our 2021 numbers are not final and they do not include out of district students. So there are, there's a little bit of a discrepancy there that we will update um, when we get the final 20, October 1 this year numbers. Um, but as you can see, I mean, our, um, you know, we have a, uh, the numbers of, of students who identify um, as white, a black or African-American, Asian, Hispanic, Latino, uh, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, two or more races, uh, American Indian or Alaskan Native, um, and white. You can see all the, the breakdown. Um, all employees, again, there is, it's, we have not radically changed since last year in terms of the balance of employees uh, compared to students. Are we, we still have a lot more, uh, the percentage of white employees is much higher than the percentage of white students and the percentage of uh, employees of color is lower than our percentage of, um, of students of color. And that's something that we are working on. Um, and we'll, I'll get to that soon. Um, but all the new hires since last October, you can see the numbers, it's quite a few. Um, one of the issues we are working on in our district is that there are quite a few people who do not self-identify. It is a choice in the, um, the forms that they fill out that they do not have to select a, um, an identif identifying um, race or ethnicity. Um, it's not something we can, can force people to do, but we're gonna look at ways to encourage people to identify um, and see if we can kind of clean up this data and have a better idea. That, that I think it's our biggest sort of gap in our data right now. Um, the AA employees. Now, um, so again, this is all AA Unit A, which is 
the, uh, the certified educators. Um, they, you can see the numbers there. I will say that one thing that is an issue is when you have a, some small changes in that are to already small numbers. If we lose one or two employees, the percentages shift dramatically, as I think you can understand. Um, for paraprofessionals, um, there's one thing that we're trying to um, uh, to figure out. The there is a made the one thing that is kind of striking in this number is the number of Hispanic uh, paraprofessionals is much lower than last year, and it just we had several um, resignations at the end of last year, and I, I need to delve into that more. But other than that, the, those numbers shift a little bit each year. Um, the rest of uh, the district in terms of administrators and central office and administrative assistants, you can see those numbers and uh, the other um, employees, including uh, a, the after school and daycare employees, maintenance, transportation and food service. And there's a, quite a few non identified in that group that we need to work on. And uh, you can see the students and staff comparisons. Um, so again, we are not reflective exactly to our student population, and that is our goal to become more reflective, have our staff become more reflective of our student population, especially the, uh, the educators and, and student facing employees. And next steps. So we now have a director of DEI, which we haven't had before, and they, uh, Margaret will work with me, with our whole administrative team on efforts to recruit and retain more staff of color. And I think having Margaret in, on this team specifically focused in this area, not just for staffing, obviously her position is focused on a lot of different areas in the district, but it is a part of her, her, her job that it will be great to have um, her to work with us and our whole administrative team. We applied for a state grant, which we don't know if it's awarded, if we'll get it or not, but if it is awarded, it would provide some assistance to paraprofessionals and provisionally licensed teachers um, to, um, for educator licensure programs and MTEL preparation. We continue to be involved in the Mass Partnership for Diversity in Education, which as you know, is a consortium of school districts with the common goal of increasing the number of educators of color in school districts. And um, Margaret and Dr. McNeil and others are working for developing affinity groups to support staff working in the district. Um, so that is that report. And I'm happy to take questions about either or everything. Phil, you're on mute. Thank you, Lynn. Go ahead, Lynn. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Spiegel, just um, one question on the people who are not self-identifying. In the private sector, under the EEOC rules, employers um, uh, can do what's called a visual identification. Have we talked with our council about whether we could do that to get more data? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, they, they don't necessarily recommend that. So uh, I will will look more into that with council, but it, it's, yeah, we haven't, we haven't done that uh, um, for this report. Um, we do, you know, we know, you know, by visual data, by other, other knowledge, that we do have more staff of color in the district that are not self-identified. Um, Great, thank you. Yeah. Talk to Ampi. Thank you. Um, Mr. Spiegel, going back to your first presentation, looking at the reasons for resignations, I'm wondering if you're hearing more people resigning because of commuting time after, since we've changed the start time for middle school and high school, because I know that was a definite concern for staff when we were discussing this. It's, it's a few have raised that as a concern. I mean, less than five, but I mean, it's, you know, we don't, that, that hasn't been the primary um, concern raised, but I have heard that, that there were people who, because of the time, the commute time, the, the start times of school really changed their commute and they it didn't make, mm -hmm. and we heard this before we made the change, that people wouldn't be able to leave their house later. They'd still have to leave at the same time and get to work early. And um, 
And then at the end of the day is when they're kind of crunched that they're going really closer to the real rush hour at the end of the day traffic. And I think that was the main, that was a concern for people. Okay, so it's been some, but not a whole it, bunch. It, well, it hasn't been the dominant reason because it, there's a variety of reasons people um, leave, but it has been one reason that I've heard more than once, probably less or less than five times, but yeah. Okay, thank you. Mr. Thielman? I, you know, Mr. Cardin made my point. <clears throat> one of the things that happens though when you do, you know, self, you, you identify people by visual uh, identification is then staff get back and say, well, why I identify, I didn't, I didn't give my identity. Why isn't that reflected in the report? That's one of the problems that happens. I'd be curious to know, Mr. Spiegel, like what you come up with to motivate people to uh, self-identify. Yeah, I think we're gonna change our form a little bit to make it, um, I mean, it still wouldn't be required, um, but would um, it's a, it would be a field that they would have to complete um, something in that field. And I think right now it, it wasn't a, it, um, a required field to complete in, in the online form. Thank you. Ms. Morgan. I'm all set. I didn't have my hand up. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the committee? Is there anyone else that would like to ask any questions or any, anything else? Thank you, Mr. Spiegel. Thank you. Okay. All set to go. Thank you. Um, state outcomes, accountability report, Dr. McNeil. Thank you very much. Uh, do I have the ability to share my screen? I'm gonna assume because Rob did, I can. Let's see if I can do it. You're all set. You should be all set. Can everybody see my screen? Yep. Thank you. So yes, uh, so this is our FY21 outcomes report and uh, it consists of uh, MCAS data uh, from last spring. And um, so I will go through the report and then at the end, I will take any questions or comments. So the objective for the report is I'm going to talk about the changes that were made to the 2021 spring MCAS share statewide trends in math and ELA, share district trends, give some observations based upon the data that you know, we've reviewed so far, and then review next steps to how we're gonna to respond to the data, and then I will take questions and comments. So you know, what's new, what was new for the 2021 MCAS? Uh, one of the things I wanna highlight is that um, students were randomly assigned one session of a regular two session test in ELA math and science technology and engineering. And so they would be assigned either part one or part two. So that was a big change. Um, the second big change I wanna highlight is that students in grades three through eight could take the computer-based test at home and that we were one of six states that allowed this to happen. And the way that the tests were administrated um, the administrators uh, monitored the progress of students through our Zoom platform. And uh, in grade 10, however, uh, the students took a two sessions test and they had to come in person in order to take that assessment. So here's a screen that highlights or chart that highlights the, the, the state's uh, data and it's comparing it to 2019. And the reason why it's 2019 is that um, due to the pandemic and school closure, these 2020 spring MCAS was not offered. So I'm looking at the last time that students were in person was 2019 when they took the MCAS. And you see some of the, how the data, the, some of the trends from the state data. And I wanna focus your attention on grades three through eight and grade 10, because that's what I'm going to focus on in my report. Um, so I'm going to give you data from grades three through eight and 10. So you kind of look at that and you can compare to how we performed, because that was the big question. How students were going to perform 
um, in comparison to the last time they took the MCAS, which was 2019. So this is it for ELA. And this is it for math. So again, I'm highlighting the bottom two rows where you see grades three through eight and grade 10. And I, I'm gonna switch back to ELA because you'll be able to tell that there was a more of a decrease in the students who achieved meeting and exceeding the standards uh, in math. You can see that big change. So getting into our district results, Again, you're looking at a chart. So I kind of, I, I took what the state did and I thought that this would be the best way to present the information this year, because to me, this is what, this is the question I kept hearing from only within the district, but also from outside of the district. How much of a change would it be for our students, you know, due to the learning platforms that we had to implement, which was remote, hybrid and in-person. So how was, how are students going to perform on the MCAS in comparison to the last time they took it in 2019? So I will just talk about how each one of these charts are organized. So you'll see at the top, you know, it's in comparison, this is race, ethnicity, and gender. And then N NM means not meeting, PM means partially meeting, ME is meeting or exceeding standards uh, together. And then you have meeting and you see exceeding. And so looking at um, the different changes, I went back and I looked at how each one of the groups performed in 2019. And then I you know, note, uh, documented the difference. So you see some of the highlights of this, uh, you'll see that you know, there's not that much of a difference there. You're gonna see that. So the headline for the report for me is that you're gonna see some increases and decreases in the percentage of students who are meeting and exceeding standards. So some of the observations that, that I've made as well as other people who have also looked at the data within the district have made is that students who are English learners, high needs, Hispanic, Latino, male, students who have disabilities and are white exhibited a one to 5% increase with meeting or exceeding standards for grades three through eight in ELA. And then also on the right hand side, you will see that the scaled score, the average scaled score and the difference between 2019 and 2021. So you'll see the average scaled score for each one of the groups. And you'll be able to see like what is the difference in performance. So this is grades three through eight for race, ethnicity and gender and then other groups. You'll see here it is for students with disabilities economically disadvantaged high needs and former ELs. And so some of the big highlights I will go over at the end. So right now I'm just gonna show you the data. And then here it is for 10th grade ELA, the changes. And as you can see here at 10th grade, there are uh, different groups like Hispanic and Latino and multiracial that had you know, double digit increases of 15% um, and 16% respectively. But you'll see here with African American Black students, there was a huge uh, decrease in the percentage of students meeting or exceeding standards. And then the second biggest de decrease with tenth grade students were students from economically disadvantaged, who are just economically disadvantaged. So here's some of the some of the observations that were made based upon those, the charts that I just exhibited. Um, and I'll highlight that a higher percentage of students who took the assessment remotely achieved meeting exceeding when compared to students who took the assessment in per person. I know that wasn't reflected on the charts, but I just wanted to put that in there because that was another question that I heard, how students were going to perform in comparison to students who took the test in person. This, those students who are in a remote program, how are they going to perform? perform and in comparison to those students who took the test in person. Another thing I wanna highlight is students in the following groups, African-American, Black, economically disadvantaged, students with disabilities, English learners and high needs perform significantly lower than all other groups. And then for 10th grade, many groups exhibited an increase in the percentage of students who achieved meeting exceeding when compared to 2019. 
and then students in the following groups, African-American, Black, economically disadvantaged, students with disabilities, high needs, and former English learners perform significantly lower than their peers. So going into our district math results and observations, you'll see again, we're looking at grades three through eight. It's broken down and disaggregated by the different groups. And you'll see that there's a more of a, you know, in line with state trends across the, across the state, you'll see that there's more of a, a dramatic decrease for how students, um, the percentage of students meeting exceeding standards. And then as you look at students with who are economically disadvantaged, students with disabilities, English learners, high needs and former English learners, you'll see, again, there is a, a more of a dramatic decrease. And this is 10th grade. You'll see, however, that our Asian students and multi students who identify as multiracial, there was a double digit increase, as well as a, a significant increase with Hispanic Latino. But again, you'll see here we have African American Black students, uh, there's 25% decrease. And then here's the data for our economically disadvantaged students with disabilities, English learners, high needs, and former English learners. Where you see that there, indeed there's no data because either there wasn't enough students in that subgroup or in that group uh, for this year or this past year, this past spring, or in 2019, there was nothing to compare. So I put just no data um, there. That's for those students. If there's nothing to compare. But I still, I still listed the average scale score for those groups, even though we could not make a comparison. So some of the highlights for our math data, again, looking, and, and this is still in comparison to uh, 2019. All groups had a higher percentage of students who achieved meeting exceeding when compared to the state. All groups exhibited. Uh, a consistent decrease in the percentage of students who achieve meeting exceeding when compared to 2019. And then for 10th grade, I would like to highlight the students in the following groups, African American black economically disadvantaged students with disabilities, English learners and high needs perform significantly lower than all other groups. And then African American black students perform more than all of their peers. So looking at our district results for science, technology, engineering, um, technology and engineering, here are the results and observations. Here's the data for grades five and eight. So grades five and eight and 10, nine and 10 take the science uh, MCAS. So again, I looked at that cohort in order to compare to the performance uh, for the same cohort for 2019. And again, just I'm, I've, hopefully I, I didn't say this earlier, but I should have said I'm focusing on the, the column for meeting and exceeding trends, also looking at the other achievement levels, but mainly focus for this presentation. I just want to see the overall percentage of students look, who are meeting or exceeding standards and then the average scale score. And then here for grades five and eight, Again, economically disadvantaged students with disabilities. There's, you see, so there's some increases. So you'll see there's a mix of increase and decrease for a science, technology, and engineering assessment. And then for ninth, tenth, and for ninth and tenth grade, uh, what was reported was for introductory physics. This is the legacy MCAS, so that's why the achievement levels will look differently. But we have warning, needs improvement proficient or higher, advanced is the higher, and then you'll see they're proficient and advanced. Is there more of a dramatic decrease for those uh, groups? I'm sorry. So some of the things I'd like to highlight for our science technology, engineering, students in the following groups, African-American, Black, 
Hispanic, Latino, economically disadvantaged students with disabilities, English learners and high needs perform significantly lower than all other groups. And then again, African-American black students perform lower than all of their peers. And then I talked about how this is for introductory physics. And there was a significant decrease in the percentage of students achieving proficient or higher for all groups when compared to 2019. So some of our next steps is, you know, looking at the data, we definitely want to triangulate the results with other data sources, which can include student work, local assessments, instructional rounds, um, and other data sources. You know, there's many other data sources that are, you know, like, you know various data sources, just so many, I, I can't mention them all here. We definitely want to disaggregate the data during ACE block and utilize these times that, and thank you know, school committee for giving us the uh, capacity to have ACE block meetings. So we have those now integrated to the elementary schedule, looking at the department meetings, common planning time. We definitely wanna uh, continue to look at the data, conduct an item analysis and use the data to assist with creating goals for school improvement plans, individual teacher, student learning and professional practice goals use data to inform instruction, and identify topics for professional development, provide professional development that focuses on anti-bias anti and anti-racist teaching practices. And we are adopting a multi-tiered system support as a framework to address the individual needs of students. And I just wanna highlight that we are committed to doing that work around anti-bias and anti-racist teaching by using our American Rescue Plan, ESSER three funds to accelerate that work. Because we know from both experience and extensive educational research that attention to these efforts will improve instruction for all students from diverse backgrounds and with diverse learning needs. So one of the biggest takeaways is that we have an, you know, a mix of increase and decrease in student achievement, but the one consistent thing that, you know, that continues to, um, be revealed in our data is that there is definitely an opportunity gap uh, amongst our groups of students. So I will open it up now. I'll stop sharing for questions and comments. Thank you, Dr. McNeil. Uh, members of the committee, uh, Ms. Morgan. Um, thank you, Dr. McNeil, for your presentation. I thought it was really helpful. Um, and it was it was helpful to read the press release in advance too that Dr. Coleman wrote so I could kind of wrap my head around it. Um, I have a couple of comments. I think they're more comments than questions, but we'll see how it goes because I often come up with a question as I'm talking. Um, I, you know, I'm fine with talking about the difference between students who took the assessment remotely and who took it in person. I'm a little disappointed that it was the top bullet point because students who are all remote are going to be, generally speaking, higher socioeconomic. They're, they're, they have parents who can stay home with them and make sure that they're, you know, in an all remote setting. So I don't, I don't give that a whole lot of weight, to be honest. Um, so I hope we don't spend a whole lot of time on that because they're certainly not comparable groups the kids who took the assessment remotely and the kids who took the assessment in person are not, they're not, their diversity is not, not similar. And the subgroups are not equally represented among those two cohorts. So um, moving on beyond that, um, I think the part that, you know, as a, as a math educator um, that, you know, the math results are obviously really concerning. They're concerning across the state. So I don't think that, you know, we're, we didn't do anything, um, worse or necessarily that much better um, than other districts teaching math to students who are only in school two days a week um, or who are in a remote platform four or five days a week having math about you know having math instruction it just doesn't it doesn't work right I mean it, it's just it's not enough instruction it's so skills based at this point that um, they just there's just was not enough time for them to to cover the material I think the piece that is really concerning, and I appreciate the way that this was presented, the comparison between 2019 and 2021 is what we needed to talk about, absolutely, and I think it's really helpful to compare how Arlington did with the state, but, you know, the piece that is, is even worse is that these, these students who had lower, who had more significant decreases performed worse to begin with, right, so they did 
they did worse. So African-American students in Arlington did worse than their black peers to begin with. And between 2019 and 2021, they dropped more, right? So, so they, it, it wasn't as though everybody started at an equal playing field to begin with, right? There were already striations in performance and variability. And so we saw those that we saw those gaps exacerbated, as did, I suspect, you know, many districts. Um, so I, I just, I really appreciate Dr. McNeil, the candor um, in addressing this. I think that, you know, I'm glad that this is being talked about. I think we need to, you know, this is the, the idea of the achievement gap in general, right? This difference between all students and then our various subgroups is something that that we went to the voters about a few years ago and, and you know, told them we were going to spend their millions of dollars on, on working to close that. And um, so, you know, at that time, obviously, we didn't see COVID coming and it has done us, you know, it certainly hasn't helped. Um, but we just, you know, we have so much work to do. And it sounds like, you know, it sounds like you guys have, um, you know, that you, you guys have a plan to work on addressing it. And I'll be interested to see how that you know how that comes into play as we look at at the budget for um for the next fiscal year so i think that it doesn't sound like i actually had a question at all so thank you guys thank you so much thank you for your comments any other member uh dr ampy thank you um dr mcneil i'm sorry i'm confused about one thing on all the graphs for the Arlington results, are the percentiles that you're showing, are those absolute percentiles? Like when it says minus 24, it's as though 64% went down to 40%, or is it 20 minus 24% of the actual number? Um, do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Your microphone's off, Dr. McNeil. Yes, I'm trying to do too many things at the same time. So let me, I was trying to All right. go back to a chart so I can talk about it and address uh, Dr. Allison Ampey's question. So when I look at 2019, it would have an absolute percentage for how many students, for, for instance, in ninth and 10th grade, I looked at introductory physics and, the, and they have reports within Edwin Analytics where they break it down by each group. So I would go back and look at the percentage for that particular achievement level. So for instance, I go back and look at 2019, how did all students, how many, what was the percentage of students that had proficient, and advance, and then they also have a column where they do they combine the two, proficient and higher. And so then I would compare that to the percentage of students that achieved those particular achievement levels in the 2021 reports. And then I would you know add or subtract, and then that's how I came up with the differences, the percentages. Okay, so I don't know, that answer your question. That does answer my question. It's something um, we should, if this is shared out to parents and such, the methodology should probably be mentioned because it actually, it, if it was the other way of doing it where it was just a drop of 24% instead of 24 percentile points, that, that'd be better. Um, so this data looks even scarier that way. Um, I can see that in most, there's big shifts to the left. Um, and uh, it's, it'd be nice to see the actual numbers too, um, but this is good in terms of isolating or, or identifying areas where there's been issues. Um, mainly I wanted to be sure that I understood how the graph was made because I realized halfway through the presentation that I wasn't really sure. Um, okay, thank you very much for this. 
Well, I, I also want to let everybody know I, I had to, you know, pare down the presentation and I, this was a lot of collaboration with Dr. Homan. Um, so I do have those charts where I, where I, with the way that I've presented the information in the past, where I'll show you a bar chart and I'll show how, show you how each group compared against the state. And I'll, it, I have graphs that show up since 2017. I can provide those graphs for school committee members, if that, if you would like me to provide that, where you can see the actual percentage, percentages for meeting, exceeding, and proficient or advanced. Uh, so I have those charts. I also have charts that show our participation rates and what is the size of the cohort for each one of the groups. Um, so I have the data in a lot of different ways. I have our student growth percentile in charts. I've charted like. <laughs> It's so much data that you receive and, and I couldn't, this could have been like, I've had I mean, 70 to 80 slides, but I pared it down to what I thought that would be the, the, the burning question that I've received from the community and within the district of, is how did we compare to 2019? Dr. Holman? I just wanted to note that um, Dr. McNeil gets all of the credit for that press release. He wrote it and I um, sent it off to the media. So that was definitely his doing. Thank you, Dr. McNeil. Thank you very much. Any other members have a question? Mr. Schleckman. Okay, um, thank you for the presentation. Um, th this is really a tough one to talk about because for three to eight, they took half the test and the test halves were not equivalent. So that there were cases where some kids got literature and some kids got, uh, uh, got uh, informational text and uh, the, 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 all these numbers are performing a little strangely to begin with by virtue of the fact that we've taken less of a test. Uh, secondly, the state has changed their method for computing growth. So we can't look at that as a comparison to other uh, children who are advancing within this cohort because they're baselining it back to 2019. So this, this, this was really, really challenging. Now, there are a couple of questions that I'd like to ask for the future because they're a little complicated and certainly not the kind of thing I'd have expected in an October meeting when the, when the results were uh, released in September. Uh, the first thing that I think is really important is there's one factor which I think is critical to understanding the results, particularly as we're grow, uh, going through to older students, is the length of time a student's been in the district. Because their results count if they were with us on October 1. But there's certainly a, a difference between a student who's been an educated in Arlington since kindergarten and a student who transferred in from another district a year or two ago. And I suspect from looking at some of the high school data that I've seen in the past is that that factor sort of explains something. And not that I wanna go and view this as a big deal. I think the question that I have relative to that is should we be devoting resources for students who are transferring into the district and treating uh, and looking at serving them a little differently than we do uh, with kids who are continuing on for, from our kindergarten. Uh, the second thing is, and again, this is not for now, but I can see where things have happened for us. Comparing what happened to us compared to 2019 Okay, we're, we're, we're seeing the statewide. We know that everybody's declining. Um, and it was a pleasant surprise to see places where we actually had improvement. Uh, comparing us to the town manager 12, at some point, and I'm not being critical now because it's too soon to go and assemble that, and certainly it's not in the mission of using this data first for the benefit of children who are in front of us, but going forward at some point, I'd just sort of like to see a couple of graphs of how our experience over the past two years compares to other communities in the town manager 12. Um, 
other the other the other thing which I think is most important, the thing that we can't see from this vantage point, are two things. If we're looking at individual students, um, what are we doing? If we're identifying students who were of concern for us because personally their scores dropped and understanding we have a far different cohort, two years worth of students dropped off from this and we've added two years of new students so that the cohorts have changed. But for kids who are with us, how many kids who are with us have had a sharp drop and what are we doing about that? And secondly, what have we learned from the way we're looking at kids, both in terms of last year's MCAS and the kids who are showing up in front of us, as a policy question for what we need to be doing uh, to add to the budget and to support the professionals in the schools to help kids who didn't make it through the pandemic as well as others did. So none of them are things that I could ask for right away, but those are my thoughts of things that I'm going to be looking for going forward. And I, and I hope we have some collaborative conversations about that. And I appreciate the candor uh, and the thinking that is behind what we saw tonight. Thank you very much. I do wanna, I do wanna uh make sure that I emphasize you're, you're absolutely 100%. So the charts that I have for the student growth percentile is just in comparison to the state because they did use a different formula. So in those charts, they're not compared to 2019, just you know, us against the state where they use the same methodology for figuring out or you know, calculating the student growth percentile. Well, they changed so the methodology they're, uh, and, and, and they've, not really been upfront about it. They're doing something now uh, called, and I've got to look this up, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, and I may not be able to hit it right away, but they've changed the methodology for computing the student growth percentile. So that statewide, normally you'd expect 20% in each of the categories, but you've got cases where they're 42% and very low growth because they're using 2019 metrics and applying that to 2021 rather than looking at growth consistent across the cohort. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. I went to a webinar where they explained the methodology and the reason for it. And they felt like this was a more of an accurate uh, depiction of growth among students. And you're right, they're using more of a two to three year, year historical context rather than just doing it for the one year and comparing that student at particular mm -hmm. achievement level against their peers. They're looking at how that particular student perform the historical performance and you're right the, there's so many different variants that might that impacted that particular mm -hmm. student's performance on last spring's uh, MCAS that yeah that you, you bring yeah. up some very good points so just the most important thing for this data right now is not, not from us unless there's policy or support that we need to help the district the most important thing is to uh, the folks to look at kids individually and and look for the ones who didn't respond as well through the pandemic and, and, and get them moving. And I'm sure that we'll see that when we look at the 2022 scores. Yeah, that's one thing we know how to do is spend, spend your money. So we'll be back during the budget season for those particular requests. Mr. Thielman. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Hainer. When I look at the results, my, my high level conclusion, and maybe maybe Dr. McNeil or Dr. Holman can uh, tell me I'm wrong, is that a higher percentage of students than we would have liked didn't make the academic progress we would have wanted them to make last year. And that tells me that this last bullet you have on slide 24 is, is super important. Adopt a multi-tier, I'm looking to my, to my left, adopt a multi-tiered system of support as a framework to address the individual needs of students. So, I mean, <clears throat> is that I mean, I guess Dr. Holman, maybe I could start with you. Is when you look at these results, what's your your kind of like top three bullets? If you were to if you were to answer questions at uh, from a group of parents, what would you say the results tell you? 
I mean, I think Dr. McNeil really hit on a lot of them, which is that there is a persistent and in many cases growing gap, particularly for students of color. Mm -hmm. And we've heard from our teachers, as a matter of fact, I think uh, Ms. Keyes said it in one of our meetings here, that they're aware that this gap is there. I mean, we've had the meetings and I know Ms. Donato um, and Mr. McEnany are gonna talk about some of this too, but we've had the meetings where we dive into this and look at this with our staff. They're aware that that gap exists and what they're hungry for are concrete mechanisms and moves that they can make in the classroom that will help them change it and turn it around. Um, and so that's part of the goal behind, you know, Dr. McNeil mentioned instructional rounds and mm -hmm. having us really think about what are our tiered systems? Um, how are we building schedules for students? Uh, how are we, you know, shifting our systems and providing access to students who may not have it to some of the wonderful things that make Arlington what it is for students? You know, do every, does everybody have access to extracurricular activities? Does everybody have access to um, you know, instrumental music to all of the arts activities, because those things enhance, we're looking at math and ELA right now, but math and ELA are one indice of a student's engagement with school. And so those would be sort of my high level things that we're all thinking about and talking about and that Dr. McNeil highlighted. Okay, okay, thank you. Well, sir, Mr. Cardin. Thanks. Um, so I guess uh, the you know the the to do list is is great, but but I do see some some urgency now that we have this data and it's out there, um, and and we have the students back full time, um, particularly in math. Um, and you know you've had you've had the embargo data for for quite some time. So I'm wondering, you know what are what are we doing? Can you talk about what we're doing now? Is it just the acceleration pathway that the state gave us? Are we have we done anything else in math? Um, to to sort of address address what we're seeing. Well, I, I think the you know things that we've done over the summer. So to answer your question, it's like we've looked at you know the data and we you know some of this is connected to what we were able to uh, cover you know with the standards and with the adjusted pacing guides last year. So that, I think that's the first thing. Like I said in our next steps, is like looking at an anal item analysis. And looking at the standards in those areas where students uh, sh showed a challenge um, with answering the questions, because the way that those in those reports, they break it down by question, the type of question, they also have released items, and then they have the standard that's next to it. And then just looking at our instructional practice, I mean, it's funny that you asked this because just the other day, we had two math coaches, and, and I want to credit Dr. Holman for bringing to us you know, this methodology of doing instructional rounds as an administrative team and connecting it to the school improvement plan goals that a particular principal might, might have in their building. So the other day we went into Thompson and before we did our instructional rounds, we had our math coaches talk about what it looks like using the Turk and Turk math, what it looks like for engagement and identifying different strategies to make sure that students are highly engaged and then really being able to hone in to like, you know, questions and the activities. And so there's, there's lots of things that we can explore, but we've begun to do that. So that's just an answer to your question right now is, you know, focusing on tier one instruction, looking at the curriculum standards that we were able to cover in all content areas and making those adjustments to make sure that we're, we're, we're viewing those uh, content standards now at the beginning of the year and then also having progress monitoring tools in place so we can see how students are performing within the classroom. I think the one thing that I would like to let everybody know is that we're using the MCAS data as a way to um, frame probing questions so we can go deeper in the data. So, I mean, those are some of the action steps that we've done just recently. And I'm looking forward to us really diving more into the data and connecting it to the local assessments that we actually have going on at the elementary level right now. Great, thank you. So yeah, particularly with, with math, I do look forward to hearing a little bit more about that. I mean, at the elementary level, I mean, you know, maybe it's adding a half hour additional math work a week, but it, that's harder at the secondary level where, and it's more dangerous at the secondary level because we've got the graduation requirement that's still in place for MCAS. Um, so I, I do look forward to hearing more about how we're going to solve this, this problem. Thanks. Absolutely. Ms. Section, did you have anything? Uh, 
Dr. McNeil, you talked about using other assessments and Mr. you alluded to it a second ago by taking, looking at this as a direction and uh, looking at other data and stuff. Uh, if, can you get back to us um, at a later date and share with us what that other data has shown, whether it validates and supports what you found in the MCAS or, I, we do a lot of public talking about MCAS and Mr. Cardin's right, it is a requirement for graduation. Uh, but at the same time, there, we all know that there are some students that don't do well with that kind of a testing. And that's why we look at other assessment. So I guess what I'm asking for is look at that other data and come back to us and tell us how it compares at some future date, please. I'd love to, thank you very much. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Dr. Ampey. Thank you. Um, I had one other question after hearing my peers. Um, I'm wondering if you feel like you have enough resources this year to help move the needle on these results that we're seeing now. I mean, not, not just move the needle up, but we're kind of having to do catch up work. So move it way up. You know, I can always use more time, Dr. Allison Ampey. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing that it's in, and, and we just had a discussion today in, in our principals meeting about, you know, looking at the challenges that students are coming in, the, you know, and be able to support them, you know, their social emotional learning, you know, the most, you know, um, emotional well being, and, and really folk and making sure that we're helping them to acclimate back into a structured setting. So it's a lot. I mean, it's not just looking at the assessments and looking at the academic portion. It's being able to create a, a safe learning environment and we're supporting them social emotional, their social emotional well-being so they can access the curriculum. So it's it's a very complex problem. Uh, I, I believe that um, you know all the comments today are basically around the, you know, our marginalized po population of students. And the pandemic kind of highlighted that. So we have to really hone in on and get really specific and strategic about how we're gonna support all of our students. And uh, that's some of the work that we're looking to do. So, I mean, as we, as we talk about the next budget cycle, I think you'll see that represented in what our request will be based upon the data and based upon the school improvement plans and our district goals that we set moving forward. You know, the instructional rounds that Dr. Holman has brought to the district and that practice. So we'll be able to, you know, utilize all that information and you'll see that uh, reflected in our budget ask. Right, I, I guess I'm thinking even of this year, not just next year. Um, I'm thinking about the growth factor funds that were put aside because we didn't see the enrollment numbers that we expected to have and whether some of those could be freed up possibly for um, additional resources to address the learning loss, or I don't know what you call this, but anyway, the, the gap and help move things forward. So thank you. Yes, we, we would, I would definitely confer with Dr. Holman as well as you know, all the administrators and you know, we can come back with the list. We can definitely take care of that. But thank you for your question. Dr. McNeil, thank you very much. And thank all your staff for putting this uh, presentation together for us. Thank you. Sure thing, thank you. Uh, school improvement plans. Um, I guess, Ms. Donato, you're on. <laughs> While, your I was gonna say, I think Mr. McInerney is gonna go first. Oh, I'm sorry, I had it in a different order. I apologize, <laughs> Mr. McInerney, go right ahead. Do you have the ability to share? Okay, while they get this set up, I just wanna say um, that this is the first round of school improvement plan presentations and that both Mr. McEnany and um, Ms. Thompson have not only done this um, work on their school improvement plans and submitted those to you for this week and they are the first ones to do so, but they've welcomed our uh, all of our administrators into their buildings this week at Thompson and next week, um, another round of administrators will go through at the Bishop. And so they've uh, been, very willing to jump in head first on this and I'm proud of the work that they've done and they've been very thoughtful about their school improvement plans so take it away. Awesome, thank you, Superintendent Holman. 
Uh, good evening, uh, members of the school committee, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Superintendent Holman. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to introduce or reintroduce uh, my partner, my leadership partner, uh, Eva Liner. Uh, Eva is Bishop's full-time assistant principal. Um, Eva and I uh, will share tonight's presentation as we are going to highlight uh, Bishop's newly developed uh, multi-year school improvement plan. Uh, so tonight, we're going to be covering um, a short introduction to Bishop. Uh, we want to highlight specific data sets uh, related to um, academic achievement. You know, we want to let you in on uh, the, the Bishop leadership team, on what the Bishop leadership team has observed uh, when we looked at these data sets, uh, specifically related to a subgroup of students compared uh, to the Bishop aggregate. So we also want to share the priorities as a response to the data that I just mentioned um, and will mention tonight, um, along with planned action steps that we're going to address um, our problem of practice. So we'll conclude by identifying resources that we currently have that um, keeps moving us forward and um, uh, highlight a couple of needs that uh, uh, we would, um, we'll probably be asking for during uh, the budget season. And uh, we'll wrap up by taking any questions that you have. Um, I, I always love talking about Bishop and how wonderful the community is. So, you know, school committee members, you know, you're very familiar with the schools, but for our viewers tonight, um, um, I, I think Bishop is, is unique uh, to the other schools in the district just due to the fact that we're smack dab in the middle of town. So if you take a look at this map uh, on the right, uh, you, you, you can't see the, the labeling or the letters or the words or anything, but uh, Bishop is in uh, the yellow right in the middle there. And um, we share um, uh, four buffer zones with um, Brackett, Stratton, Thompson, and Hardy. And we also have families all the way to the north to Winchester and all the way to the south to the border of Belmont. So you can get a good sense of the diverse uh, district population we have here at the Bishop. Uh, we live uh, uh, by our community, um, our core values. So at the Bishop, every community member lives by these three main core values of respect, responsibility, and regard. Um, students and staff, they live up to this by showing respect to everyone they encounter and the materials that they use inside and outside of the school, uh, the responsibility taking care of ourselves um, and others and the environment around us. And um, a big one that we have that we uh, lean on a lot is having regard for others and their differences. Uh, the adults in the building reference these three core values whenever appropriate with students and amongst each other. And as you can see, our core values are posted in high visibility areas uh, to include right at the entrance of the school, right when you walk into the lobby, throughout the halls um, and, and school. So um, as we get started, I thought it would be helpful to put our work into perspective related to COVID and where we currently find ourselves as a nation and as a community. So, our time leading up to this point, one of the main academic and social emotional concerns was how would these past 18 months of COVID really affect our students and adults? As an entry point into this discussion, uh, this chart highlights the last grade our students had a complete year in the classroom. So I think the question of whether or not these COVID years has had any effect on our students and adults is pretty clear. Um, We've just completed first full month of school. And with this, you know, administrators and staff uh, have realized that there's a, it's a different normal, if you will, uh, that everyone's adjusting to. So there's a recalibration of sorts as our students re-enter the classrooms and playgrounds full time. So uh, as part of the administrative work this summer, Eva and I, uh, along with the district leadership team, begin to look at uh, specific data sets to confirm any assumptions we had related uh, to this topic. Um, to give you a little just data snapshot, and, and you know we like to celebrate uh, small wins. It's what keeps us moving forward, motivated, dedicated, and passionate about the work that we do. 
Um, this data set, um, well, I want to just back up. I just want to mention that the data sets that I'm going to use for this presentation are not exclusive to our district work and uh, to our district leadership teams. Uh, there are other sources that teams use to disaggregate the data. Uh, however, for tonight's presentation, we're going to look at MCAS scores from spring 2021, as you see here, and a four-year outlook over time, 2017, 2021. So this highlights, this slide highlights Bishop's strengths related to the spring 2001 MCAS uh, compared to the district and state grades three through eight. Oh, bishops represented in green, district in orange, state is in blue. Um, I say here tonight, proud of this accomplishment um, from last year's bishop students' performances in line with the district's average across the board, three through eight, and noticeably higher than the state's average. Oh, uh, you know, during these COVID years and even during a typical year, it's it, it's important, like I said, to uh, celebrate these wins as we continue to move forward with our work. Now, um, as Eva and I and district leadership started looking at the data this year, uh, this summer, um, some priorities um, came to the top very quickly. So looking at the combined Bishop aggregate, that's, that's the easy work. Um, it's when our teams and administration begin to dig in, disaggregating this data by subgroups that the academic and social emotional disparities begin to surface as highlighted by these two graphs here. Um, the data set that immediately came to the surface uh, was the four-year outlook over time, the 2017-2021 of our high need subgroup of students compared to the Bishop aggregate. So uh, for the viewers out there for context, um, the high needs classification um, our subgroup includes uh, current English language learners, former English language learners, um, students who receive specialized instruction through individual education plans, and socially economically disadvantaged. So as you can look, as you look at these comparative graphs, uh, the one on the left is Bishop's ELA with uh, the one on the right math. So both sets of data represent a clear achievement gap uh, between our high need students and our bishop aggregate. Again, going back to the question of whether or not these 18 months has had an effect on student achievement, it is clear that our high need subgroup has been affected. While the gap in math has relatively is relatively consistent, it's the ELA, ELA achievement gap that's widening. So Bishop's problem of practice is obvious. Um, Bishop's leadership team must do better uh, we must be, do better to engage data teams and facilitating efforts uh, specifically focused on our high need students. And so that begs the question of how uh, we're going to do this. So within our school improvement plan, we have these uh, four um, objectives. We have two instructional objectives and we have the equity and school culture and management operations. So first, um, I want to start with key instructional ob objectives related to the problem of practice that I just mentioned. Um, and then I want to highlight the two other objectives that can stand alone uh, or be part of our efforts when we're looking at high needs, uh, the high needs subgroup and the academic, academic achievement gap that currently exists. So our first instructional objective is focused on improving Bishop's data collection process through collaborative teaming. I'll get into the action steps here in a few. Um, while um, the instructional objective two is geared toward literacy and the use of assessments to inform instruction, uh, best practices and interventions, it's directly tied to the collaborative data teamwork that we are engaging in this year and years to come. Um, it makes sense to direct our early childhood grades, for example, toward early reading approaches, lesson delivery, uh, best practice, um, and using assessments to drive our instruction and interventions. Um, objective three is our equity and uh, school culture goal uh, that Eva will speak to, uh, to in, um, in a few. And um, 
the last objective uh, found within the Bishop 2021-2024 uh, school improvement plan focuses on just the administrative assistant transition that Doc, uh, that uh, Rob Spiegel just mentioned um, as we had a, a retirement in the front office and a second initiative related to the management and operations is dedicating is dedicated to you know maintaining brick and mortar assessments and remediation. So getting to our key initiatives and um, our action steps. Um, appreciatively, um, so thankful that our district administration, along with Dr. McNeil, a few years ago, I remember sitting here uh, speaking to this group as we were talking about um, uh, bringing in full-time specialists to drive administratively controlled data collection time within the school day. So, um, so uh, we have, uh, it's created a daily mas master schedule that allows for teams of teachers, uh, administrators, uh, coaches, and interventionists um, and specialists uh, to me once a week during the school day. So it's an agenda-driven, uh, data collection, action-oriented format. So the meetings are identified as ACE blocks. Um, ACE, uh, the terminology or the acronym ACE comes from um, a book, DataWise, that the assistant superintendent and the leadership group um, have dug into two summers ago, and, and we continue to reference it, reference it as we continue our work. Um, so ACE standing for assessment, collaborate, and evidence. Um, and this built in time, it's absolutely priceless um, having this built into the schedule. So historically, and, and not held just to the Arlington Public Schools, um, time to work in teams, looking at student work and assessment data like we are doing now through our ACE blocks was few and far between. So I just have to say that, you know, having this time built into the daily schedule is a game changer. And um, I'm sure you're gonna hear more about ACE blocks in the coming weeks, as you hear from the other building um, administrators. It's just a really exciting time um, in our schools, in the district, as this time has been created. All right, um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, this slide. Thank you, Mark. Um, so Bishop is in its second year of working with um, DESE's PBIS training, along with some of the other schools in our district who will probably speak to this initiative um, in their own presentations. So PBIS stands for Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports. And this is a research-based social and emotional learning framework that has provided Bishop a structure to create school-wide expectations. So the matrix shown on this slide um, was created over the past year or so um, with feedback from students in grades three, four, and five and teachers and ties directly into our three core values um, that uh, Mr. Uh, McEnany uh, spoke about earlier, respect, responsibility, and regard for others. So as you can see, if, if you can see it, I know it maybe appear a little small, um, it's all worded in positive language so that we're talking about the behaviors we wanna see in our schools, which is a big part of the PBIS framework. So instead of saying <sighs> one in the hallways, we would say walking shows respect in the hallways or when you keep your hands to yourself, you're showing responsibility. So at Bishop, um, we have a number of teachers who use different SEL, social emotional learning practices in their classrooms, such as responsive classroom, open circle, mindfulness, um, second step, and growth mindset. Um, and the PBS, PBIS framework, which is really nice, really, it doesn't interfere with any of these other programs. And actually, in a recent conversation I had um, earlier this week with our SEL coach, Laura Rodriguez. Um, she was actually complimenting the Bishop staff for using a variety of SEL programs within the school because there's not really one size fits all for SEL programming. Um, so the school-wide work we're doing through PBIS creates really common expectations in the shared spaces around the building, along with a common language for all of our staff and students. And we're really looking forward to um, our work this year and in the coming years as well. Great, 
Thank you, Eva. I really appreciate that. Um, so we get to um, our final slide here as we um, want to just kind of highlight the current resources that are available um, to sustain our efforts and the effectiveness um, that um, we, uh, we strive for. So um, I know I speak for the other six elementary building princi principles when I express um, sincere appreciation for the school committee and the district's support for full-time assistant principals. Um, I have to say personally, having a full-time AP and Eva Liner, um, it's allowed me um, and other principals to be the instructional leaders we were hired to be um, without being pulled 20 different directions, taking care of everyday life within the building and the playground. Um, huge, very, very grateful. Um, Full-time district, and school specialists to support our ACE block times. We currently have this in place and we're hoping that it remains uh, for our teams to make progress in all the areas identified within the school improvement plan. Um, ACE blocks are a must. Um, I can't, you know, we were talking about, uh, Dr. McNeil just said more time. We've created time and this is the time. We must take advantage of this time. Um, and we will be able to leverage this time. Um, our meetings, um, this month with our groups have yielded some really great just initial work. And I'm just looking forward to um, how that work is going to progress and evolve. Um, the must haves, I, I want to highlight before my time is up, um, and, and the, our needs and able to support uh, Bishop school improvement goals. So um, a comprehensive, reliable data um, data collection system and platform. So the district has, we've rolled out a comprehensive data bank hub for all administrators and educators to access as teams, um, as, as the teams, um, as we use the many sources of data that we use to inform and drive our um, instruction. So this is actually gonna be our first full year that the data bank is online. And we're looking forward to this being up and running 100% you know, in the near future. So with any new software, um, data dumps, all that comes, I don't want to say glitches, but it comes, there comes tweaks and adjustments that need to be made. We're in that process right now. We've got a lot of information already downloaded in there and teams are already digging into the data bank. Um, and so we're just looking to kind of strengthen that and to maintain and sustain, um, you know, that hub of data. Um, and then finally, um, as we look at our coaching model in the district, um, you know, there is, um, I am a strong believer. Um, my colleagues might feel differently. Literacy coaches might feel differently. I feel strongly that literacy of coaches that who are assigned to each elementary um, public school in Arlington um, is a must. I, I think it, there would be a lot of value in having um, a literacy coach that's housed in one building full time. So um, like I said, it kind of speaks to itself and the, the power of having a dedicated literacy coach in each building. So at this time, we have five district literacy coaches. There's seven elementary schools. So we've got approximately 50 classroom teaching teams. And you can imagine how challenging sharing five literacy coaches and uh, is and you know, data teams must have this resource coaching available to them in order to strengthen their professional practice and collaboration within a data team setting uh, within our ACE blocks. So um, this concludes tonight's look, um, snapshot of Bishop School Improvement Plan uh, and priorities. Uh, there are more objectives and action plans found within, and I'm happy to take any questions related to those and what was presented just now. And I just wanna thank you so much for the school committee's continued support and uh, commitment to the Arkansas Public Schools. Thank you, Mr. American. Any uh, members of the committee, do any of you have any questions? Ms. Exton. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for this and the clear sort of outline of the um, goals and objectives. Um, I have a quick, question then I just yeah a nod 1920 was the first year that you had ace blocks is that correct it was it was 19 um and we lasted 18, until 19? March 12th 
Okay. Correct. So, so until March 12th. Yep. Okay. So I, I, in your pointing out sort of where students have the last time they had a full year um, of regular school, I think it's also important for um, the committee to, to consider that the first time you all had ACE blocks, you didn't even have a full school year. So this is something that you all are getting back on, on board with. And I think it's important for the committee and the community to know that 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 was interrupted for all of you as well. Um, yep. The other the other question, um, two questions that I have, and I'll say them both, and then you can answer. Is um, do you feel like the data coach position um, that was recently created um, will fulfill some of some or many of the needs that you're seeing um, in what you're sharing about what you need to have happen at the ACE block? And then my other question is, um, what resources and supports do teachers need um, to collect and record all of this data? Because that's, that's a lot of, um, it's a big ask for classroom teachers um, to collect all of that. So what else um, do they need? Great. Uh, no, and uh, Liz, I, I, I thank you for uh, bringing that point up about the, the ACE blocks and our interruption and our first year of, of digging in. So um, just a little follow up to that is, you know, our first month have been meeting with our teams to kind of to talk about how we're going to use ACE blocks. Um, we used a meeting talking about our student learning goal that we have here at the Bishop related to the first instructional priority, academic achievement uh, priority um, that I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. And uh, now we're looking at learning how to look at the data bank. So yeah, so we're re-entering and reacquainting ourselves with the process. And um, the early results is that, you know, this is going to evolve into a wonderful um, collaborative uh, teaming process um, as we get moving. So um, the data coach, so the data coach position and, and math and literacy coaches are, I, I put in two different buckets, if you will. So I, I feel that the data coach, um, so it, the administrators and teams work together. We identify their problem of practice, um, a data set that we want to look at. I envision using the data coach, uh, approaching the data coach, pulling the data from uh, for us, um, and actually visiting one of our ACE block meetings to help us kind of interpret the data. Because um, we have to be really careful when we, when we present data to teams. We want to make sure that it's not overwhelming, confusing. We'll make sure that it's clear um, with, um, you know, a point in mind. And, um, you know, you kind of have to direct data teams in those directions. So as an administration, as, as an administrator, um, it's really important that um, we have someone that is an expert at collecting data and helping us interpret because principals don't know everything. And it's just even better having that additional data resource um, at our hands. Um, and then using literacy coaches and math coaches and social studies and science coaches to um, look at that data with us and then start working with teams as far as best practice, interventions, and, and, and just um, looking at the data to inform our instruction. So giving them um, the tools and the approaches that, you know, to strengthen their already best practice. Um, and then what do teachers need? Teachers need time. Um, and they, we, there has to be an understanding that, I mean, teachers are straight out. Um, it's the first month of school and it, you know, and it feels like April. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, mentioned that today and it's, um, you know, it's, it's been very taxing. So understanding where the adults are um, and providing them with time to actually do this work um, is extremely important. So um, that time is going to come with ACE meetings. Uh, common planning time and uh, building faculty meetings and district professional development to do that. Um, when they give assessments to their classrooms, they are responsible to input that data into spreadsheets, which then are dumped into our district data bank. Um, so, um, you know, the heavy lifting for, for the educators are finding the time to assess their students within a specific assessment window and then recording um, that within the spreadsheets. Um, we have some software, excuse me, some software with uh, some reading assessment 
the dibbles that we um, are working on as a district to implement where um, teachers and specialists will be able to record um, uh, the student assessment through a tablet and that tablet automatically dumps that information into a spreadsheet so they don't have to manually data process and it gives us really, really nice visuals um, and everything. So um, again, I just think that it's really important that um, we value teachers' time, we acknowledge teachers' time, and when we do have their time, we make it meaningful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other members? Uh, Jane. Thank you, Mr. Hanner. Um, so thank you. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, the presentation was really helpful. Um, I, I also, you know, I'm, I'm glad that we're talking about ACE Block tonight. Um, it seems like such a long time ago that some of us had some, some challenging conversations with Dr. McNeil about this. It was a big investment. Um, of a lot of money, and and I remember some you know some some strong conversations in budget subcommittee about whether or not this was what what we wanted to do, and um, and you know I I'm very confident that we made the right decision, and and you know that Dr. McNeil brought us the best plan, um, and and it's it's hard sometimes to wait for that return on investment, right? Because it's just it's been it's been a while, but um, I think that it's 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 obviously critically important, um, and I think you know we just have to continue to remember that we didn't we we were not able because of the challenges of the schedule last year to 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 have this time. So uh, you know I I see it as as beginning again, but building on 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 what was done in in 2018 and 2019. So um, I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. Um, I'm also happy to see in this plan the emphasis on on early literacy. You know, it's it, after the last presentation, um, it's, you know, it's easy to say, oh, my gosh, the math, but the math, but the math. Um, but I think, you know, the part that concerns me is that the the students who may have been more impacted in their literacy development skills by a, uh, you know, a challenging uh, school year last year are, are arguably the kids in K-1 and 2, right? And we didn't see their, they didn't take the MCAS, we didn't see how they did, so we're not going to know for a couple of years um, from, you know, as we compare to other districts, how, you know, how our, how our youngest learners fared. So I'm really glad to see that, that, you know, that you guys are, are, are looking at that. I'm not at all surprised, um, but I think that it is really important not to, not to lose sight of that. And then my final comment is one that I shared um, with Ms. Donato earlier. I, you know, I, I'm really glad that, that we're doing these assessments and that we're looking at them. I do hope that part of how you talk about it is how, you work to be to better share the results of student performance with their families and with their caregivers because that is a place that you know my experience in this district has been that that information is not often shared readily um, and it takes a fair amount of effort on the part of a parent or um, a guardian to actually get their hands on it um, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's I, I you know I think that as you as you work to use this more effectively and 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 the the um, educators and administrators hone the way that they talk about it i hope that part of what the outcome of that will be will be uh, um, uh, more of a a way and a capacity to share that with families because this is data that we're taking on on kids right they're they're somebody's kids <laughs> and um, at some point we need to to engage them in the conversation as well so um, that's all I have, but thank you. Thank you for coming. I appreciate um, the two of you going, going first. Um, I've, I've been on a school council. I was on a school council for a couple of years. It seems like a lifetime ago um, and looking at these school improvement plans. And this is the first time that we've, we've seen them as, I've seen them as a school committee member. So um, I think that that's, that's exciting. And um, so thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you. I, I really appreciate that, Jane. And yeah, we're excited too to be here tonight uh, presenting our school improvement plans. Any other members, committee? Mr. Schlickman. Thank you. And thank you for going first. That's the most difficult position. 
because everybody else is going to have the benefit of <clears throat> tonight's discussion. Uh, the one thing that I'd like to see that I really didn't get a sense of is measurable outcomes and specifically um, not that you'd have it presented in your, your plan, but sort of a, you know, there are a lot of action steps. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not seeing the measurable outcomes that, that they connect to. So, I, so I, I would have a hard time picking this up and thinking about were we successful and did we make pro, uh, progress based on what I'm reading the document. And, 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 and I don't want to argue the document. I think it's very thoughtful. But as a follow-up at some point between now and the end of the year, and it could be just presented at the end of the year, I'd sort of like to see some sort of a response coming back that is self-evaluative as to what you thought your measurable outcomes were, your, the progress you made, and even more interesting, where did you make mid-course corrections based on what you found to be the reality during the school year? So those are the things I'd like to see at the end, uh, as we approach the end of the year. Uh, <clears throat> But I really do read into this a lot. Yeah, I, I used to read these for a living um, for 30 schools in Lowell. And uh, I, what I've seen so far here has been very, very thoughtful. But I'd sort of like that to, to come to play as we approach the end of the school year. Thank, thank you, Paul. Um, and not you're not arguing the school improvement plan. I understand that. I appreciate the feedback. Um, it's October. And um, so what, what's happening is, is, yeah, you did get an incomplete document, to be honest, uh, because it didn't have those measures. And you know, since we're here tonight, October 14th, um, what's happening with our teams is that we provided, Eva and I provided a school um, student learning goal of improving our data practice in teams. And so what's going to happen um, as a result, our teams are going to start diving into the, the, the data here in the next month, and they're going to be choosing content um, areas that that team wants to work on. It can be because we didn't want to give them the full spectrum of, you know, content to, you know, start digging into this work. So small steps at a time. So as that work evolves, I'm going to add to this document. Um, we'll be, um, you know, I'm thinking in another month or so. But thank you for that feedback. Very helpful. Yeah, it's very difficult to do, especially this time of year. The, the, there are two purposes for this document. One is to sort of chart your progress through the rest of the year for which you need the measurable outcomes. And doing the data analysis and doing the date, data teams and picking something out uh, is all for a goal of improving student achievement down the line. And so that if you're looking at it in terms of improving uh, student writing on open response questions as measured by open response questions or some measure of improving uh, informational text, you know, that, that's cool. Okay. Uh, the other the important point for this, which is really critical in an early document, is to identify things that we need to be thinking of as we're looking forward, looking toward the document, uh, the budget document starting in December, January, February, because the school improvement right, plan right now that is only focused on what's happening between now and the end of the year is merely rearranging the deck chairs of what you have already have in terms of staffing and resources. And, and the most leverage you have is in terms of reorganizing staffing, hiring thoughtfully, reorganizing and reprioritizing your budget, which is sort of that, that critical element that, almost nobody seems to get right on this. And so I view this as a, a very thoughtful progressive district some, with some great people, which is why I'm really happy to see the, the process engaged right now. And, and, and I do appreciate the thoughtfulness of your document and the early uh, response. Is there anyone else at this time? Ms. Donato, welcome. Thank you. Before I begin, I wanted to say hi to Amy, who's a former Thompson student. Looks like the other student rep showed up. Hey, Amy, nice to see you. 
Nice to see you too. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and Mr. McEnany is going to be my Vanna White. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate he's going to take care of my slides for me. Um, Hang on. Well, it's coming. Uh, I got, I can everything's stay. open. Hang on. I, oh, all right. Hang on a second. <laughs> so sorry. Let's see what happens I, here. Vanna, you're fired. No, I'm kidding. Um, I can just say good evening, everyone. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the school committee, Superintendent Holman, Assistant Superintendent McNeil, and members of the Arlington community. Um, I'm happy to be here this evening when Mark said he's excited to be here to share. And I mumble to myself, speak for yourself. I am excited to share about the work we're doing. Um, this is new for us to be presenting like this to the school committee. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here and kind of highlight what we're working on at Thompson. And more importantly, I'm thrilled to have uh, my assistant principal, Prisna Chevalier here with us. And um, she and I work together on this plan and uh, it's been great to have her along in this capacity. So, here is the agenda for the evening. Mark and I talked and we kind of kept our presentations in similar formats just to make it a little easier. Um, I'll share about our community. I'm gonna take a look at where we are, where we want to be and what our plan is on how to get there. Uh, these goals are looking to be achieved over the next three years. And we acknowledge that the effect of the pandemic won't fully be known immediately. And uh, our goals are actually based on the work that we can begin now and build upon over the next few years. Thank you, Mark. Uh, at the end of last year, uh, when speaking with the PTO and the PTO presidents, we spoke a lot about our excitement about our full return and what that would look like for this coming year. In my head, you know, I pictured kind of a marching band, but I wouldn't go that far, but smiling faces, balloons, the works. While we aren't quite there yet in terms of the, the pandemic, uh, what I can tell you with great certainty is that our school community is thrilled to be back together. Uh, yes. We're at 508 students now, and we are about 80 staff. So there's a lot of us coming through these doors every day, but it feels so good to be together. And as you will see on the slides, the pineapple has become a symbol that embodies Thompson, a school where all are welcome. Over the years, we have what I called embrace the pineapple and incorporated into our motto. We, are be, we say, be a pineapple, stand tall. And this year we're saying, be your best. This year, we'll be working with our students to outline what this looks, feels, and sounds like across all areas of our school. Our culture prides itself on acceptance and growth, and we value our partnership with our families and the community at large. Thanks. Here is our snapshot. Uh, for tonight's presentation, we're gonna look at an overview, overview of MCAS scores from the spring of 2021, a multi-year look at math MCAS scaled scores and student growth percentiles. And then I've pulled two responses uh, from two student questions from the Panorama survey from the fall of 2020 that I'd like to discuss. Um, this slide in particular highlights Thompson's strengths related to the spring MCAS as compared to the district uh, and state in grades three through eight. Thompson is represented in green, the district in orange and the state in blue. And as you can see, Thompson students performed in clo closely in line with the district's average across the board and higher than the state's average in each area. We are within the meeting expectations range for both ELA and science, and we're just at the meeting expectations range for math. Um, I truly believe that the work that we do is measured by so much more than test scores. Uh, but with the challenges and successes we faced this past year, I'm so proud to see that we still remain in line with where the district is. All right, now we start to talk about the priorities and things that we wanna highlight and work on for the coming years. So these next two slides will highlight the data that informs our priorities for our school improvement plan. And during our summer work, uh, our leadership team worked together. We had a workshop and in addition to Krizna, we were joined by two curriculum leaders uh, to assist with taking a deeper look at what, what the data is telling us. It was so helpful to have others' perspectives too from the outside, outside as in not Krizna and I, um, taking a look and share and digging into our data. So when we dug into our MCAS data, we noticed two specific points that we are going to highlight in our plan, that our Black and Hispanic student scores in math dropped from 2019 to 2021, and that over the last three years of MCAS uh, scores, the student growth percentiles have significantly declined for our black and brown students um, and our Hispanic students. And I know some decline uh, is present for most of our racial groups, 
However, you'll see, as you can see in this slide, it's most significant for our Black and Hispanic students. And our focus is going to be on what we can do, that's okay, on what we can do to improve these data points uh, specifically. On this slide, this slide shows data from the fall 2020 panorama survey uh, of students in grades three through five. And we've highlighted two student responses that um, to two questions. The first one says, at your school, how often are you engaged to think more deeply about race related topics? And the second one in the bottom right says, when there are major events, news events related to race, how often do adults at your school talk about them with students? So we had 202 students respond to those questions. 70% 70, 70 and 67% respectively answered sometimes once in a while and almost never combined. So at Thompson, we pride ourselves on being one of the diverse, most diverse schools in the district. So this data is certainly surprising and an area in which we wanna make tremendous growth. I do believe our staff takes cues from our students and we're, we respond accordingly. However, how can we be more purposeful in our planning and intentional in our instructional practices so that our students do see that we address such topics? Here are our focus areas for the year. Our first instructional objective is around math discourse. And our initiative is that we will establish a data team and increase collaborative structures to support student learning. Our second objective is uh, around school climate and culture. And Thompson will establish a positive behavioral interventions and supports team. And our third objective is around equity and school culture. And Thompson School will engage in professional learning opportunities that promote culturally responsive teaching practices. Thanks, Mark. Um, so our key initiatives and action steps. Our first instructional objective is around math discourse. So when we were talking about effective ways to increase student engagement, specifically in math, student discourse rose to the top as a high leverage practice. Discourse is the mathematical communication that occurs in a classroom. Uh, it happens when students articulate their own ideas, seriously consider their peers' mathematical ideas and perspectives, and then uh, they construct mathematical understanding. Uh, we want to encourage students to construct their own understanding through discourse as a way to teach mathematics, especially since the role of the teacher has transformed from the person who just gives over information and knowledge to one who presents worthwhile and engaging mathematical tasks. We want our students to develop deeper understandings of mathematics, and they can do that when they engage in meaningful social interactions. We believe all students bring their own experience to school each day and contribute and can contribute in meaningful ways through, those, through discourse around those experiences. So in order to do this, we plan to establish a data team to determine protocols for consistently monitoring and looking at student data during ACE time, to establish structures that increase collaboration, and to provide support and professional learning around the strategy of student discourse. That's Ms. Kaplan in the picture. <laughs> um, that's a, yeah, thanks Mark. Our next slide is around key initiatives and action steps for developing of the PBIS team. So Thompson also began the work of exploring PBIS before the pandemic. Uh, we had actually done some consultation uh, with some um, people from PBIS around tracking office referrals and ways that we can improve our systems around that. And then last year, we had the opportunity to be a part of the DESE PBIS Academy. And this year, we'll be bringing a number of staff into the academy to help support the work. Uh, last year, we did not have a a large group participates, so we have decided to do year one again in the PBS Academy so that we can bring all of our new team members along and up to speed. So as you know from the Bishop presentation, PBIS, PBIS stands for Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports, and this is a research-based cell framework. Thompson has engaged in establishing school-wide expectations, and we did that a number of years ago using our responsive classroom model, and we are still keeping uh, in line with some of the responsive classroom practices and adding PBIS into how we operate uh, at school. And we're seeking to revamp those school-wide expectations and want to work with all our stakeholders to bring them back to life across all areas, all spaces in our building. And our ultimate goal is to collaboratively create a, ma a matrix of expectations. So what do these expectations look like, feel like, sound like? And all over, all over our building, whether you're in music, whether you're at recess, whether you're in the cafeteria, whether you're in the classroom, 
and then have a consistent approach to how we support students when they struggle to meet our, those expectations. Similarly to Bishop, we have a number of teachers who use various cell practices in their classrooms. And I feel as though our, our toolboxes are deep and PBIS will provide us with some more consistent systems to support student behavior in a positive way. So in order to do, sorry, Mark, in order to do that, we're gonna continue in the PBIS Academy. We're gonna evaluate our current expectations, procedures and behavior management practices to determine what needs we have. And then we're gonna establish school-wide behavior expectations and supports. And our last initiative is around culturally, culturally responsive teaching practices. Um, our equity and culture objective focuses on culturally responsive teaching and the brain. Um, as you saw in our panorama data, many of our students out of the 202 who completed the survey do not feel that race and identity are explicitly discussed at Thompson. We wanna change that for our students. We want our staff to feel empowered to engage in courageous conversations and discussions with students and families and with each other. So through our all staff read of culturally responsive teaching in the brain, we'll discuss ways in which one's culture programs the brain to process data and affects learning relationships, as well as what are the key practices that we can focus on to build staff capacity for being intentional when planning their instruction and conversations. Um, the pictures on the slide actually are from our last early release day and staff uh, worked in small groups to do a protocol where they each took a chapter of culturally responsive teaching in the brain, pulled out, had time to review it, discuss it, pulled out salient points, and then did a share out of, for each chapter for the entire staff. Yeah. Yeah. So our key action steps will include um, engaging in the staff book read of culturally response, staff read of the book, culturally responsive teaching in the brain, um, practices where we will reflect on our own identity and awareness of our own biases, and then examine current practices and evaluate their effectiveness toward creating an inclusive classroom environment. And then we're asking staff to identify culturally responsive practice teach it, practices that they would like to implement. We're gonna have them identify at least two up to four practices that they feel they want to specifically and mindfully incorporate into their teaching practices. Okay, so current resources and available uh, that are available for sustainability and effectiveness. Huh, Mark said it well, our full-time assistant principals. Um, I can't tell you the prison has always been a support for me here when, and my go-to person, but having her in this capacity has really opened up other opportunities for me to be an instructional leader. And that's just beginning. And I'm thrilled to, that we have invested in that as a district. Um, I do believe our ACE times are key components for us to make progress. Uh, this is where we'll be able to look at assessment data. We'll be able to collaborate with service providers and support staff in addition to the classroom teachers to really get into what the data is telling us. Um, the early release schedule has been, I'd say, a real part of how we are doing some learning this year. Teachers and staff, as Mark had mentioned, are tired and we, we are bringing a lot to the table every day and finding time to engage in some of the things that we used to maybe do outside of school or volunteer to do in, in book groups and things um, a couple of years ago before the pandemic started. We are using our early release time to learn together. Um, and it has really been a great way for us to begin and plan for the year. Um, mm -hmm. A building-based math coach, that is, has been um, a, a huge component to the work that we intend to do and that we have done. I do believe, similarly to Mark and even talking about literacy coaches as well, but having coaches in our buildings is so important for our teachers to be successful, and then that in turn will help our students be successful. Um, our math coach, Sonia Conley, is a part of our school community. She's built relationships with people over time with our staff. She is really seen as a valuable resource because she is present in our building and is available if a teacher wants to run something by her or to get some feedback. Or just yesterday, in the last week, she did this amazing work pulling a presentation together for our lead learner workshop that we hosted at Thompson. So, um, and I think, because our staff recognized that Sonia was gonna be a part of this and that we were hosting, they were more eager to offer their classrooms for us to visit and to kind of 
show what we do here at Thompson. So I do believe that's a big piece of our success. And of course, ongoing collaboration with particularly related to our school improvement plan, our math coach, our cell um, coach, and our DEI director. All right, some of our needs to support Thompson School Improvement Goals. Um, I think continuing our participation in the DESE PBIS Academy is big. I also, along with that, comes the need for substitute coverage for teachers as we are asking them to be a part of this team and step out of their classrooms during the day to attend the training sessions. Um, I've had a number of staff take the IDEAS course, and that's uh, the initiatives for developing equity and achievement for students. And I would say it's had a profound impact on the way that they approach their planning and their thoughts around um, how to deliver equitable instruction for students. I would love more, have more staff have the opportunity to participate in that. Um, we would like to continue ongoing professional development in the areas of culturally responsive teaching and, of course, with our goal on student discourse, continue to continue to support teachers with understanding, recognizing and practicing that um, across all areas of the day, but we're focusing on math. And I imagine there'll be a need for some funding to support some stipends for staff as we look to create data teams and lead in certain areas that would happen outside of their contractual school day. Oof, I think I think I breathed through that. Sorry, <laughs> I made my notes and I was trying not to be too verbatim. Um, so that concludes my presentation for tonight. And there are additional items, obviously, in our school improvement plan. And I'm happy to take any questions. I continue to thank everyone for their time and support. And um, it's I continue to love living in the town where I work and serving the Thompson community. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Schlickman. Thank you. Uh, I got a nice sense of where the Thompson School is and who you are from both reading your uh, school improvement plan and uh, listening to you talk about it. Um, uh, in terms of the data teams, uh, the one thing I liked that I saw that you, you you really were pointing to mathematical discourse. And I, I'm interested in seeing how you're going to document or measure that as an outcome of the work you're doing. Because I think that's, I think it's very valuable. I think it's really an interesting thing to do. The other thing I was happy to see was that you quantified your PBIS in terms of reduction in uh, office referrals in that uh, I, my assumption is if you're saying that you're going to reduce it by 5%, you, you've been tracking this and you're, you're going to show that data. And I'm looking forward to seeing how you do that, both in terms of the, the, the type of referrals that you're not getting anymore and, and how you think that's improving the climate in the school. So this, this is really interesting. I thought you did a good job for uh, the first time doing a school improvement plan to the school committee. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Cardin. Thank you. Uh, so first I wanted to mention that, uh, don't give them much credit, but US News and World Report ranked Thompson number one in the district. So congratulations. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, and, and actually, out of the out of the state rankings, you're 123 out of 900 and something. So that's that pretty good as well. So thank you. Um, so congratulations. Um, so I think, as I understood it, I, I think Thompson was was deeper into responsive classroom than maybe Bishop was, and maybe I didn't get that right. But I, I would never it was never quite clear to us beyond Hardy how far responsive classroom was was implemented. But I thought that Thompson was was fully in. Uh, and I, I wonder how, what, what made you decide that that wasn't enough, that you needed to go to PB by it, PBIS and, and how you think those will work together? Sure. Uh, I, we actually have been talking a little bit about this because there, there has been some resistance, I would say, around PBIS, but only, and that's pre-pandemic. So it's so hard to re almost remember where we were and now where we are. Um, However, I will say what we're looking for, they, they can coexist. Um, the frameworks, I think, are similar. What we are looking for is more of a direct, um, well, system for tracking student 
behavior data. That was a big piece. They have a, a suite um, that's part of their program that uh, we can be a part of and pilot that helps track student behavior data. Um, and what we are seeing is that we, with Responsive Classroom, we've implemented practices of morning meeting consistently. We are practices of students take a break. Um, you break it, fix it, repair when things happen. Um, what we are looking for is ways to engage in motivating students more consistently across all areas of the building. Um, a few years ago, we did create our school-wide expectations and we went through the responsive classroom process to do that. And I would say we met and we did presentation around what that looks like and sounds like in different areas in the building, but the practice of teachers and um, specialists still creating their classroom rules um, still existed and still exists today. What we're looking to do is have these school-wide expectations that mesh with what we want to see in the classroom, what we want to see in the hallway, what we want to see in the calf, what we want to see in music. Um, so it's it's really a hybrid of bringing the two together and hopefully having the matrix and the expectations and outlining it and bringing it into one set of expectations, regardless of where you are, including your own classroom, um, will help with consistently approaching students when they are struggling and what we do when that happens. I hope that makes sense. Yep, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Rampey. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna try and ask this question. I'm not, it, it's a little hard. Um, so my sense from hearing your presentation and listening to, I mean, reading your school improvement plan is that the culturally responsive teaching practice is intended to increase achievement. And first, I don't want to disagree that culturally responsive teaching practices are very important. Um, but because we haven't seen lots of the MCAS data and stuff, I wondered what the role is of lower socioeconomic living situations in terms of the wide gap that we saw with um, in achievement. And it seems like if that was also, I mean, if, if there is a gap, I'm assuming there, there is a gap, but that that would suggest a different sort of intervention possibly um, like trying to do more enrichment activities over the summer or, or more additional schooling or, or you know something to bolster the again I'm, I'm kind of jumping ahead to guess what the reasons are for lower achievement but something to bolster the um, lesser exposure to educational activities outside of the school year. And so I'm just wondering, have you looked at the data with that, you know, in, in that aspect and what did it look like? And how did you decide that it was the culturally responsive teaching that was the most important um, thing to focus on? Sure. Um, I don't I don't have that data readily available. I know we did look at it. And I, once we pulled out what our problem of practice was going to be, I specifically honed in on those. But I can certainly take a look at both and how they relate and report back. I don't mind doing that at all. Um, what what we do see is. Our, our teachers, I, when I when we the cultural response of teaching in the brain is really the anchor for what we want to do, we want our staff to have an understanding of how student relationships, how students of color and the relationships we build with them um, and what they bring to the table, uh, what they bring to school each morning, how that and their relationship has an effect on them. And what are the practices that we, I'd say we are doing a lot of things to try to engage all of our students, but what are the practices that we can specifically focus on that we know uh, are going to, to be responsive to those students 
that we know we see a lack of engagement from as, as proven in the data that we see. Um, we wanna amplify some of our practices that we're already doing, but making sure that we're intentional in the way that we are approaching conversations with students, that we are actually highlighting who they are and what they bring with them each day. Um, I always say, I feel like we're an inclusive community, but I also feel like we're inclusive because we don't always name everything. We don't always, um, I don't know how else to better word it, but I want us to get better at naming who we are, what we, what we bring to the table, the, those experiences and how those can be honored through our instruction, through our conversations, through the work that we do day in and day out. Um, I hope that makes sense. The, the book itself is more of an anchor and a way to help have these conversations and to focus the staff on um, meaningful ways that we can engage uh, in those practices. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Ms. Morgan, did you have? Yeah, I just, I wanted to, um, so thank you, Ms. Donato for being here. Um, it, it's great to see the things that, that you feel like you need for, for your school improvement plan to be implemented at Thompson. Um, I think the piece that I am a little bit challenged by, um, and I guess this connects a little bit to what Mr. Cardin said that, you know, the idea that that while responsive classroom and PBIS are certainly not mutually exclusive or in conflict with each other necessarily, um, the district sort of made a, a pretty significant move towards RC, I think. Um, it's what they use at the Gibbs um, and it didn't permeate through all of our schools. And so now it I, I'm trying to sort of understand what this, you know, we heard from Mark at Bishop about PBIS and you know, we're hearing about it at Thompson. And you know, I, I'm all for you know, continuing professional learning for our teachers, obviously, around these kind of practices. I think it's really important. I just, I'm, I'm a little confused that we're sort of, it, it feels to me like we're sort of, I guess I need help understanding that this is a progression as opposed to like a pivot. And, and if it's a pivot, I, I mean, that's okay too, right? Like we can, we can pivot. I'm just, I, I guess I'm, I'm a little confused. So I'm trying to understand. And maybe this is a question for Mark as well, since he's here. I don't know. I just, I thought we were doing responsive classroom. We did, we've, we've spent, you know, we've invested heavily in the training and the time at, to your point that we need we need to to provide um, our staff and educators time to do this during the day, and so we've we've done a lot of that, and and so now I guess now what? So I guess that's my question: is sort of tell me more about. Sure. This new I, I I do think I do think we are still committed to responsive classroom and and the structures that that has given us and the practices that we regularly incorporate at Thompson, and I think probably similarly to Bishop. I think what we were still finding is that we, we are still seeing some challenging behaviors and we are looking for additional two tools on how to respond to those and respond to them consistently. And I think this is a vehicle to help us and our staff um, go through the process of taking a look at what we're seeing, why we're seeing it, and then systematic ways that we can approach what we're seeing. Um, and I mean, I will say, right, we, we, even though we've done some real work around responsive classroom and have specific pieces of it that we consistently implement, I would say that hasn't necessarily changed some of the challenges that we continue to face um, with some of our students. And I think like with anything, the more resources we have and the more tools we have in our toolbox, uh, the better we'll be able to respond. And my hope is that by engaging in the academy, it also educates the team that we bring there um, to hone in and, like I said, kind of take a look at what we're seeing, why we're seeing it, and how can we collaboratively work together to improve that for all all students. Um, so I don't I don't think it's a pivot. I think it's in addition to, and I think responsive classroom is still very much alive in what we're doing, and this is an addition to that. Mark, do you want to add anything or? 
Uh, no, that was well said, Karen. And and just uh, you know, quickly is like you know, responsive classroom is um, is an approach. Um, it's not a program. It's not a curriculum. Um, where PBIS provides a, a, a finite schedule uh, structure, um, a, a building and community structure that's visible. That uh, where everyone's working together for you know with consistent language and expectations um, in the community. Thank you. Any other members? I'd like to thank both uh, the principals. Uh, your days are long, your weeks are long, and thank you for taking the time to spend it with a bunch of old grumpy people. That's for me, not the rest of the committee. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Have a good night. You too. Okay, uh, buffer zone report, Dr. Holman. All right, hold on one second while I share my screen. Um, I don't have slides to go with the buffer zone report for tonight, but you have the memo that I provided to you in your packet for this evening. Um, and I'm going to share a little bit of additional information about um, sort of how things worked out with buffer zones this year. Obviously, uh, I was in a position of beginning to assign buffer zones as I came on board on July 1st. Um, and Dr. Bodie assigned a lot of buffer zone families who live in buffer zones to their respective schools. Uh, before I arrived. And so I was sort of coming on board and beginning to understand the buffer zone process while also uh, doing it and finding out where the hot spots are uh, throughout the district in terms of enrollment and average class size. So uh, a little breakdown of buffer zone choice assignments by school, and I'll blow this up a bit so it's a little easier to see. Can everybody see this okay? We just we got have a, your desktop. A colored screen, that's all. Oh, hold on. Big one. Okay, I see why. Sorry, technical difficulties. How about now? Got it. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Um, so this uh, table shows the buffer zone choice assignments by school um, and how many uh, families who are in the buffer zone were assigned their first choice at each school or to that school as potentially their second choice, as well as the total for each of those schools. So in the first column, for example, you will see that um, 34 students were assigned Bishop as their first choice, two were assigned to Bishop as their second choice, um, and so on down the list. And you can see exactly how many students were assigned uh, to each of the schools and the total 16 were assigned to their second choice school 153 we were able to assign to their first choice school uh, where possible we try to give families their first choice school where it doesn't disrupt balances um, in certain areas but what I will also say is that the enrollment balances are not the primary or first consideration uh, siblings really are the first consideration we don't want to break a family up across multiple schools um, whether or not students have IEPs that could be best serviced at a preferred school, for example, uh, related to a specific program, or the average class size for the student's grade level are also the things that we look at. You receive my enrollment reports uh, at each of our meetings, and that is the report that I use every time a new buffer zone assignment comes through. I take a look at whether or not there's a sibling in the preferred school, and then I take a look at how um, what size the classrooms are on average at that school at that grade level. So that's sort of the process for assignment. Um, I also included buffer zone assignments by grade level and school at each of the schools so that you could see across the schools and in each of the grade levels um, how students were assigned and allocated at each of the schools. I also have a little bit more information and I'll stop sharing. I can bring this back if you want to see it. Nope. There we go. Um, I'll also share that uh, there wasn't, um, it was pretty evenly distributed. There were some instances where one school was pretty hard, uh, more preferred over another school in a particular buffer zone. Um, but for the most part, families split across the buffer zone areas. There is a preference for the school where that family would have been originally districted before we had the buffer zone. So for example, if the original zone um, was Bishop, then there are more families in that area or that immediate neighborhood that would choose Bishop, for example, but that's not unilateral. Um, 
or across the board there and there really wasn't a very strong preference for any one school it kind of varied based on where you were in town um, and this is a very useful tool for balancing out grade levels um, i obviously had areas where uh, for example at stratton in fourth grade i was very careful about assigning students there and i know that dr Bodie was before me and so this does give us the flexibility to sort of balance out class sizes where we need to I think we were lucky this year that we were able to give most families their first choice, but in certain instances, we obviously needed to balance things out by giving families their second choice. So I'm happy to take any questions about the buffer zone process or report. Mr. Schlichten. Um, thank you. I think, think that you've hit the major points. The only thing that, that I ask going forward is and because you're new to this, I don't expect an answer tonight, but that you'd be thinking about between now and say January or February, uh, if there are any changes we should be uh, making to our policy uh, going forward. Uh, but thank you for the report. Uh, I've got a good sense of where we are and that uh, with over 90% of the people getting their first choice, I think that we're doing pretty well. Mr. Carden. Thanks. Um, so un under the policy, you actually can't assign siblings to, to a different school. You have to assign them to the same school. So typically what we see as far as getting the first preference is we take out the, the sibling assignments. And so let's say there were 50 sibling assignments out of the 150. Um, you know, then you get 100 that got their first choice and 16 that didn't. So that, you know, that just puts it in a, in a, a better context for us. Um, because that those 50 assignments aren't discretionary. Um, so I, I think going forward, we'd like to see that reported that way, I think. Thanks. Ms. Morgan, were you waving at me or did you want to ask something or say something? No, just my only comment about the buffer zones. I mean, the report's really helpful. Um, we, pre-pandemic, we had sort of begun very early conversations about looking at buffer zones um, and what they look like. And we spent a lot of time, not a lot of time, but we spent some time with the GIS guy from the town and looked at dots and things and stuff. And anyway, um, it may be a conversation that at some point we need to um, reopen and see if we need to, um, you know, and, and a lot of it's driven by you, Dr. Holman, because you're sort of the, the wizard behind it all, right? To some extent, right? You're given broad latitude in, in how you utilize the buffers to sort your class sizes out. Um, but I think, you know, I, I think at some point, and it, it's maybe not this school year, but coming, you know, it's, it's definitely something that we started to look at before COVID. Um, and obviously it, it took a backseat, but I, I think we probably do at some point, you know, this year or next year, need to take a look at the, the buffer zones and decide if we need to make any adjustments or create um, you know, a three school buffer. Um, there were there were various scenarios that were floated. Um, so I can't even remember where we did that in what subcommittee that was even I, I don't remember where we did it, but I, I know I was there. So that's all I got. Everyone else. Uh, okay. Uh, Dr. Rampy. Thank you. Um, first, thank you for giving us the information. Um, I actually think the graph, the table that I'm looking at right now is the um, buffer zone by grade level in school, partly because it gives me a sense of how many students have transferred into the Arlington Public Schools. I mean, now it's only the ones who landed in the buffer zones, but the numbers are actually higher than I would have guessed. Um, out, outside of kindergarten. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other um, question, or a couple other comments. So one thing that has come up in the past, and, and this is before your time, um, is that there was some confusion between whether someone was, whether you consider the first choice, the actual first choice that they put down on their paperwork, or whether you consider the first choice um, later because sometimes the students were given, given an opportunity to switch later 
and I mean, before the school started, but but sometime over the summer that things would open up. And at that point, they chose to stay with the 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 thing which had been their second choice. Um, so that's one question that has come up before. Um, and then another thing we have seen is a table where it's crisscrossed with the buffer zone, the, the um, two schools and which way students have, have requested or, or gone. And to some extent that's helpful data to us just to get a sense of whether there's any trends and, and if we're looking at various um, increasing buffer zones or something, just where we might have, where there might be more pushback or not. Um, I know that you made an illusion in your comments about that the things were pretty even, um, but the numbers were kind of nice with that. And then finally, uh, I didn't pull the policy information up in front of me, but my recollection is that the policy actually asks us to find out what kind of effect the using the buffer zones is making on the class size um, amounts. So, you know, what would classes have looked like if we didn't have buffer zones and what do they look like with buffer zones? And we haven't seen that information very much, if at all, but it is something that's in there and it's helpful when we either have to explain to parents why buffer, zone ex buffer zones exist and why they're useful, why don't we just get rid of them, things like that. So, um, but thank you. And these are all more for going forward um, because um, this is the first time you've seen this data and stuff. So thank you. Mr. Schlickman. I just want to thank uh, Ms. Morgan for the point that she raised that we were, were looking at a more thoughtful look of adjusting the boundaries. I believe that was going on in the community relations subcommittee. Uh, I, I think we should be doing that, but I'd like to see us wait a year and let the uh, the superintendent go through a year of assigning under the buffer zones before we uh, dance on that third rail. Is there anyone else? Thank you. Superintendent's report. Okay. Give me one moment. Hopefully I will do this right this time. Do you see my slides? Yes. Good. Okay, I will start with an update on um, the state of the schools as we move through another year of pandemic schooling with just a really quick COVID-19 update. Uh, this week, we are seeing a decrease in school-based cases. Uh, we have only had three so far this week, and that is trending down from every previous week of the school year, which is fantastic news. This week, we just got the town data in actually um, earlier this afternoon. And so I've included that on the graph on the right. We are seeing a slight uptick uh, this week in both the percent positivity rate in Arlington as well as the average daily case rate. Um, and that average daily case rate, I show you on purpose because it's one of the signals that the town is using to determine um, or think about things like mask mandates. It's also a determinant for countywide data, whether or not we are considered as being in a high uh, substantial, high, moderate, substantial, or low spread area. Um, and those things all have implications for masking, which I wanted to talk to everybody about next. So as members of the community know, and we've received questions about, um, the commissioner recently released information uh, that said that he was going to allow for a waiver for uh, dropping mask mandates in schools where vaccination rates were over 80% starting on October 15th and uh, that the mask mandate that's been instituted by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education uh, was going to be dropped on November 1st. So with that new guideline came a lot of questions from families about whether and when 
uh, Arlington would consider uh, their masking requirement. The, and one thing that I wanna make sure I emphasize is that we are working very collaboratively with the town and we are still falling under the town's mask mandate. So that mandate is in effect until Middlesex County gets categorized as a county with moderate or low spread for at least two consecutive weeks. Currently we are um, considered as being in a substantial spread uh, county and we were in high spread um, before this past week. So we just dropped down into substantial. And once that mandate is lifted, so at least two weeks after we drop down into substantial, being substantial spread, which likely won't happen this week because we just saw a slight uptick in town um, this week, then we can consider multiple factors before we start to make masks optional. Some of those factors include whatever the current rate of participation in COVID-19 pool testing is at each school. And currently at AHS and at the Audison, the two schools where students are eligible to be vaccinated, uh, that rate is below 80% if you include staff and students. So we're working on that. We are, I was actively planning with Dr. Jenger earlier today on how to um, increase access to the pool testing at the high school and we'll be doing the same at the Audison so that we can ramp that up a little bit. Uh, we would love to have a little bit more participation than we have right now. Audison is very close to 80% participation in pool testing. Um, and it is also worth noting that the state does not require this. This is something that's a priority for Arlington. Um, the state does not necessarily even uh, recommend comprehensive uh, COVID pool testing of students who are vaccinated, uh, but we have found that we've had a lot of breakthrough cases. And so this is very important to us. We wanna make sure that it's not spreading in schools amongst our vaccinated uh, students, just as much as we wanna make sure it's not spreading amongst our unvaccinated students because those vaccinated students go home to younger siblings. Um, the current vaccination rate of students and staff will also be a major consideration. As you know, the state uh, set their limit at 80% earlier in the year. Our committee that worked on our pandemic recovery plan had set a, a level or a limit of sorts in collaboration with the town around 90%. So our bar was pretty high for uh, vaccination rates of students and staff at each school. We are currently above 80% at Audison and AHS, so we are meeting the state's standard. Um, I haven't, uh, we haven't run the numbers super recently on vaccination status, but we're going to do that very soon. It's a little bit cumbersome and tedious because we have to sync up with a state database in order to get the students vaccination rates. We have to count that um, manually. So we are in the process of doing that to see what our vaccination rates are at Audison and the high school. Most recently, they were in the upper 80%. Um, vaccination eligibility and rates for all students across the system is also a consideration. So yes, we're glad that our students at Audison and the high school are eligible for vaccination. However, we also recognize that they exist in households that might have younger siblings. And so unmasking those students um, could pose risks to other members of our community, particularly to our schools that are full of students who are not eligible for vaccination yet. And so to remove masks at this time, uh, feels like it wouldn't be prudent, both because of the town mandate and also because uh, we don't have all of our students even eligible for vaccination, though we're really looking forward to news very soon that they will be eligible for it. So any, and as you know, we've said multiple times, if we're going to make determinations about mask requirements, we're going to do that in consultation and collaboration with the Department of Health and Human Services as well as the Board of Health and our own nursing department. So at the moment, we don't have updates on this topic. I know that it's been on families' minds. Um, we will continue to be fully masked, at least for the time being, and we'll bring updates to the committee and the community as we have them available. Um, also in updates for this week, the Arlington High School varsity teams are having a spectacular season. Their combined uh, win-loss tie record is 56-14-6, which is an 80% win percentage. So they're doing great. Um, boys soccer is undefeated. Uh, and they're currently 10-0-2, and, and they only have a few games left, and they've qualified for the state tournament. So I just wanted to share those good news items. Um, as our student reps uh, shared with you, as Megan shared with you earlier in the meeting, uh, there is a metamorph metamorphoses fall play this weekend that I'm very much looking forward to going to with my, um, with my daughter. There are performances on Saturday and Sunday at 12 p.m. and 4 p.m., and Liana Bassett said there are still tickets available today. So her email is up there on the screen. If anybody would like to go, they are holding an outdoor performance and it should be a lot of fun. 
Um, you may have seen, we, we were sharing a couple articles on social media feeds uh, that we've been observing and celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day in APS, the first Indigenous Peoples Day in Arlington officially. And I want to say a special thank you to our librarians and our APS uh, social studies departments who shared comprehensive resources with families and with teachers to help teachers engage in conversations with students around um, Columbus, around colonialism, and around the observance of Indigenous Peoples Day and recognition of Indigenous Peoples Day in Massachusetts. Um, and I also want to uh, say a quick welcome to the team to um, Chris Kamaforo, who is a new intern who has joined me as a superintendent intern. He is currently a student at Harvard, and he is here to help uh, build our capacity in the central office. Uh, Mr. Hayner has had the opportunity to actually meet uh, Chris, and he has dove right in, and he's taking assignments, and he's helping us move some of the really exciting initiatives that we've shared with you tonight and in previous meetings forward. And it's really nice to have the additional help um, in, in our office. So thank you and welcome to Chris. And I also um, wanted to just acknowledge that the enrollment report for this week is in your packet. There aren't any major changes um, from last week, a couple in and out here and there, uh, but no major adjustments to enrollment numbers over the past couple of weeks. And I'm happy to take any questions that the committee has. Anybody on the committee? Uh, Ms. Sexton. Thank you. And Mr. Hainer, I don't know if this is an appropriate time or if you want me to wait for subcommittees, but I'm just wondering if there's any update on the playground structures at Stratton and Pierce. Mm -hmm. um, Go ahead. Yeah, that's fine. You're asking the superintendent, I assume. I am, yes. <laughs> sure. So I, um, I'm a, a, a little bit flying blind here because I don't have the person who's been working on it with me tonight. Uh, but Mr. Mason has uh, traveled with Joe Connolly to each school playground to look at those playgrounds and um, talk about and identify which parts of each playground belongs to the school department versus which part belongs to the recreation department. They've also determined uh, through those walkthroughs which equipment was out of order and the work that needs to get done to get that equipment back in order for use by uh, the students. He, they have gotten some estimates for playground repairs, um, not including the Stratton playground. Those repairs will cost $35,000 or so. Uh, the budget set aside for playground repair costs is less than that. Uh, the Department of Public Works is collaborating with us too and is able to step up and take care of some of that difference. However, the Stratton School Playground um, repair is going to be significantly more expensive um, in the six figures at around $113,000. So we're looking into what we're going to be able to do to collaborate with the town to make sure that we can make all of, all of these repairs happen. Um, so we're currently in the process of deciding exactly how we're going to split out some of those costs. Uh, we, you know, we share these playgrounds. They are the town's playgrounds and they are our students' playgrounds. Um, so we want to work together with everybody, DPW and the rec department have been very collaborative over the last uh, several weeks with Mr. Mason. He deserves the credit for getting some of this moving forward um, with, with the town departments. And we're also working on a plan with the rec department for being more proactive about the playground so that we're not um, experiencing a lack of communication and then suddenly having equipment go down and not be usable at the start of the school year. So we wanna come up with a plan for how we're going to build out the playgrounds and assess them moving forward. So that's the update that I have at the moment. Um, any more detail on that might need to wait for Mr. Mason uh, or for a future facilities meeting. Glad you weren't prepared. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Mason gave um, me all that material. <laughs> no, that's helpful. I, um, it just, so it sound, it sound, I realize you don't know any more than that. It just sounds like so Stratton is going to take a really long time. And I, I just think, and I, again, I don't know it Pierce too, but I just think about, you know, the young kids who are the ones who use the structure and that can be a really challenging time socially for children. And then we've got teachers trying to supervise them with fewer activities. And I, I, I'm just, my, I want to be mindful of, um, if that's sort of contributing to challenges, maybe it's not um, around play, but um, you know whether it's PTOs supporting with other materials for kids to use outside. But I just I think about the sort of domino effect of the lack of of playground on 
on the students, on the teachers, on the staff. So thank you. I appreciate the report, um, but I hope we can get this moving. Is there anyone else at this time? Okay, uh, moving on. Um, the uh, revised handbooks, second read. Um, Dr. McNeil. Yes, thank you, Mr. Hainer. So I'm bringing for a second read the uh, handbooks that were presented at the last school committee meeting. Uh, there was only one. Um, there was only one piece of feedback that I acted upon. Acted up, acted upon, and that was from uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. And so we have taken since taken care of that edit uh, with the Gibbs handbook. And so now I'm presenting all handbooks again for the second read and for approval from the full school committee. Mr. Schlickman. Move approval. Second. Is there a second? Second. Sorry. Uh, okay. second. second. Any further discussion? Uh, roll call vote for approval of the handbooks as presented. Dr. Ampey? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Ms. Exton? Yes. Ms. Thiel Mr. Thielman? Yes. Uh, Ms. Morgan? Yes. And I vote yes, unanimous vote. Thank you, Dr. McNeil and everyone. Thank you, Thank you to everyone. Uh, uh, policy EBC, uh, supplemental and amendment. Mr. Schlickman? Uh, as you can see in the packet, uh, I've made a revision in the proposed amendment to cor uh, correspond to the expressed desires of the committee at the last meeting to word it so that uh, vaccines that are fully approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration are the vaccines that are required for participation in co-curricular and acti uh, extracurricular activities. With that, I move approval of the amendments to file EBC supplemental general interim policy and COVID related issues. Is there a second? Second. Second. Thank you. Second. Any further discussion? Roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Uh, Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Rampey? Yes. And I vote yes. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, consent agenda. <laughs> All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, which the, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant number 22064 dated 92821- for seven, $757,798.06, warrant number 22078, dated 10 12 21, in the amount of $407,774.47. So moved. Need a second? Second. Um, roll call vote. Uh, Dr. Rampey? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Mo Ms. Morgan. Yes. And I vote yes, unanimous. Subcommittee and liaison uh, reports and announcement. Budget. We'll be meeting in the next week um, to discuss some items that the superintendent would like to discuss. Community relations. Thank you. Um, we are having a school committee chat for families in the METCO program this Saturday, October 16th at 11 a.m. Ms. Morgan and Mr. Schlickman will be there. Uh, the link was emailed out to Ms. Diggin, by Ms. Diggins today, and it's also on the APS website. And METCO families were invited directly by the METCO director. Um, and then my other announcement is that the community relations subcommittee will be meeting on Monday, October 25th at 6 p.m. to discuss after school programming. Thank you. Curriculum instruction assessment and accountability, Mr. Cardin. Uh, we're looking to hold a meeting uh, the last week of October 
and I'm working with the superintendent to find a date and the subjects that will be covered. Thank you. Thank you. Facilities, Mr. Thielman. No report. We reported last week, and there was a good conversation just now about playgrounds. Policies and proce procedures, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, just thank the committee for the adopt adoption of the policy amendments this evening. Thank you. Arlington High School Building Committee, Mr. Thielman. We met last week uh, and uh, the project is moving forward and on, and on schedule. Are there any liaison reports at this time? Uh, Mr. Cardin. Yes, yeah, so I just wanted to share, I think everybody's gotten the announcement that the Arlington Education Foundation is having an event on Tuesday at 5 p.m. in the um, Robbins Memorial Garden to welcome Dr. Homan to Arlington. Thank you. And in, in the event of rain, it'll be moved to the inside town hall. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any future agenda items at this time? Okay. And we do not have any executive session. I want at this time entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. Is there a second? Second. second. Roll call vote. Ms. Morgan. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Thalman. Yes. Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. 915. Very impressive. Yes. Mr. Carden. Yes. Dr. Ampey. Yes. And I vote yes. Thank you all. Be meeting is adjourned. Good night. Good job, Bill. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.